A very good morning to everyone watching us today. Uh, this is the ODPP Cafe. Welcome. Thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Anita Onuko. I'll be your host. Remember, this is a show brought to you by the Office of the Director of Public Prosecution. And it's a show that is meant to inform you and educate you and most, more, 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 more sensitize you, sorry, sensitize you on matters of criminal justice system. Uh, feel free to let us know where you're watching from. You can comment and tell us, you can ask us any question you have at least uh, with regards to this topic today. Uh, I have a team of experts who I will introduce a bit later, and there are other experts waiting to uh, respond to your questions on, on social media. We are on Twitter at ODPP underscore KE. We are on Facebook, as you can see, and also on YouTube at the Office of Director of Public Prosecution. Please subscribe, follow us, share this video, share this, uh, the, 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 the tweets so that we can have a, a, a wider conversation on the topic today. Um, engage, uh, engage with us. We are really here to engage with you and to educate you and to clarify things that you may not be able to understand about the criminal justice system. So as usual, I'm going to take you through a quick sneak into the courts and of course what has happened at ODPP this week. That is what we do on every show. We may not pick uh, uh, all the cases in the courts because really there are so many cases going on, but just a few of them just for your information. So I will start with what has been happening at the ODPP this week. Uh, the ODPP and the Judiciary ICT teams met up to enhance their e-filing system. Uh, the system is a platform that is meant to, I mean, everybody's going digital. So lawyers and non-lawyers are able to initiate and complete the process of filing cases without really remotely, without meeting. I mean, COVID has changed a lot of things and how we do things. They do not need to visit the courts, premises, or even to, uh, to go to banking halls to pay court fees. So that is uh, something that is ongoing. I don't think it's a one-day event, but at least it was initiated this week. So now to the courts. Uh, a court in Mombasa ruled that uh, public officials, state officials, cannot represent other state officials in corruption cases. This was a win for the fight against corruption, I believe. I mean, sometimes you think some things are common sense until a court rules, then you discover we've been doing things wrong. So the court cited a conflict of interest in oversight, the oversight role as the main reason for barring uh, persons holding elective positions from legally representing civil servants in draft cases. Uh, this was just Eric Ogola, and in this regard, he barred here Senator James Orengo, and any other state officer from representing the former uh, MD, KPA MD, uh, Daniel Manduku, in a graft case. I think that's a good win for anti-corruption. Uh, the other story we have today was a misrepresentation or a misreporting that was done by the People Daily. But uh, the ODPP set the record straight. It was about the fake gold scam by Jared Otieno. Uh, what was reported was that the case has been dropped, but uh, the DPP clarified that the case is ongoing and still intends, he does not intend to withdraw the case. It's a case of uh, 23 million uh, uh, shillings against uh, Jared Otieno and other, and other suspects. Uh, the DPP was reacting to reports, of course, that were published, uh, alleging that he had intended to withdraw the case against the key witness because a file had gone missing. So remember in 2019, Otieno uh, was involved in a fake gold transaction and he was re released on cash bail, uh, 1.5 million. We talked about bail last week, and remember this show is about is, is about educating you. So I bet right now when you read about somebody out on bail, it doesn't mean he's out for free. It doesn't mean his case is gone. It just means he's out as his case continues. And of course, we talked at length about this last week. I hope you remember that. If you don't, feel free to ask. We have experts here who can definitely uh, get you to understand it more. The next case we have in the courts is about a Juja MP an aspirant actually, who is charged with uh, using fake academic certificates to be cleared for the contest. Uh, Koimburi is called Koimburi. He was accused to have obtained a KCSE certificate in 1994, purporting to be issued by NEC. And the other certificate he forged, unbelievable, was a certificate of participation. I didn't think he needed this so bad. Certificate of Participation, which he forged in 2011, purporting that Jekwart, uh, he participated in an event at Jekwart and was given a certificate. He denied the charges and was released on 100,000 bail. Again, bail comes up. It will always come up. And a pre-trial set, uh, pre set was, date was set for May 10th, 2021. So Koimburi is not free. He is meant to still attend his court cases. And of course, uh, uh, follow what the court has said, the conditions set by the court. The next case, we talked about it when it happened. It's about uh, a bizarre case about a father, Nyeri, 
who ordered for the, or rather he said that he organized for the killing of his own son. So his case is to be mentioned on May 10th. Uh, the Nyeri businessman, Steve Wangondu, together with four others, were charged with killing uh, Steve's son. And they are out again. I like that this thing keeps coming up. I'm also learning and engaging with it now for real. So these guys are out. They were, they were freed on a one million bond each. So each of them are out again, but not totally free. They are still going to respond to their, to attend to court uh, cases. So Justice Florence Mushemi directed the accused to surrender their passports. Remember again, this is one of the conditions that sometimes the court sets up for guys, for people who are going to be released on bail or, or, or bond, that you, you surrender your passport. Maybe you're a flight risk, maybe you have dual nationalities. So this is one of those that was uh, conditions that were given for this case. Again, these guys were asked not to leave the jurisdiction of the court. Again, another condition. Like we said, in as much as the, the rights, if it's in the constitution that you have a right to bail and bond, there are some conditions that are set by the court that you must adhere to. Again, bail is based on trust. So if you don't, if you don't show that you're trustworthy, then this, is, this right is taken away from you. So it's a right with conditionalities. The last case I'm going to talk about is the Rio Olympic scandal by one Hassan Wario. Hassan Wario is a former cabinet secretary in the Ministry of Sports, and he was engaged in a corruption scandal at the Rio Olympics. So Wario in the Rio, it's like a match, like it was. <laughs> <laughs> so Chief Magistrate Elizabeth Juma gave prosecution 14 days to file submissions and serve the defense team, who will then file theirs 10 days after prosecution serves them. So that's what has been happening, happening in the courts. As you can see, a lot of the things we talk about here are actually happening in real life. So really, you can see how it applies. Maybe you read the news and you want to understand exactly what is happening. Then you don't go, you, you act informed or even uh, post or tweet an informed tweet, not just based on uh, hearsay or what you imagine is happening. So I'm glad that we talked about bond and bail today at length. I mean, it is what you've discussed <laughs> quite. <laughs> it confuses a lot of people. So anyway, thank you again. Uh, we have been talking about decision to charge uh, on Twitter and on Facebook. We put up a few posts just to introduce you to the topic. People have engaged. They've asked questions. And today I have a power panel. A power. This is the real power panel to discuss decision to charge. And I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves, to just tell us again, again a bit about themselves and who they are and what this whole process, how they played a role in this process. So decision to charge is a serious thing. I promise it's very serious that I, I, I think I had someone, one of the prosecutors saying that it is a life altering decision. So the decision whether to charge or not to charge is life altering. So it's important to listen to this discussion because it informs, it's like, it's at the heart of the criminal justice system. So you know when cases go forward or when they are dropped or when they pick up, uh, alternative systems to justice. So I'm going to introduce my panel today, my power panel, and I'm going to start with Madam uh, Dorcas. Please introduce yourself and tell us uh, a bit about yourself. Of course, we know you, mm -hmm. but yeah. <laughs> I'm Dorcas Edouard, a senior counsel, and I'm the Secretary of Public Prosecutions. And uh, I took part in the development of the decision to charge guidelines. This is the second time, the first time when we um, when we reviewed the uh, 2015 um, policy and when we came up with a new one, and I'm amongst the people who has been taxed to operationalize the new decision to charge guidelines. And uh, as one of the managers in the ODPP's office, it is my responsibility for purposes of succession to make sure that the people we leave behind operate and apply the decision to charge properly. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wamaida. Morning, Anita. My Morning. name is Wamaida Kimani. Mm -hmm. I work with International Justice Mission. I lead their function on policy, partnership, and advocacy. We have been partners with the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions since about 2012, wow. as they were establishing as an independent office. And we have worked alongside them as they worked on the statute then, their initial policy, um, prosecutorial policy, and subsequently as they developed these key tools on streamlining the decision to charge. Okay, Karibu sana. Yeah. I think I'm um, Steve Ogola. If you are not on social, <laughs> then you don't know Steve. <laughs> I'm a trial advocate, okay. a litigation lawyer, All right. and a managing partner at Sarong and Stevens Advocates. Okay. But permit me to recognize, and I, mean, I was listening to you and the powerful introduction you've given us, you must recognize and celebrate mm -hmm. the aggressive public information sharing you know, campaign that ODP is doing, it's really transforming lives. For majority of Kenyans coming into contact for the first time with the criminal justice system, having some basic information or understanding on arrest and pretrial detention, 
plea taking and plea bargaining, bail, bond. bond, and surety is very, very critical. It builds their confidence because we say, if you don't know, then you enter the criminal justice system based on rumors and guesswork, and an ill-equipped client, because yeah. those are your clients, probably is not going to have an effective defense strategy if they don't have defense lawyers. So I think we must commend. You know, we are always quick to fault public institutions, but very slow to recognize and celebrate the small wins. I don't think within the East African community there is the, an equivalent of the DPP elsewhere that is doing this. I think we are trailblazing and yeah. continue with the good work. I really, really learn a lot, and I, I hope that Kenyans that listen to this also learn a lot. Yes. Good job. We do. We are, I'm also learning. Yes. I say, join me on the journey of empowerment. I always say that. Yes. Tomita Karibu, welcome. Thank you so much. Good morning, Anita. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Tomita Karibu, and I'm a federal prosecutor from the United States, working with the U.S. Department of Justice. And I'm stationed here at U.S. Embassy in Nairobi. Uh, we have had uh, the honor and pleasure of working with the ODPP um, over a period of years and um, got the pleasure of helping the ODPP see other countries and how they develop uh, decision to charge uh, practices and the processes for intaking a case. So had the honor of uh, uh, leading a, a study tour to the United States and to, to Scotland with the DPP and the SPP and other members of the Decision to Charge Implementation Committee. Um, and we continue to support their efforts uh, during, during the implementation process. Thank you so much for coming. I keep saying on this show that American civics, uh, crime civics are really spoiled and still in my They meet someone who has to consider the years of how their case got to go because of what they watched mm. on how to get away with murder, for example. Oh. So you really spoiled us. Karibu Mule. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Victor Mule. I'm acting deputy director of public prosecutions. I'm in charge of county affairs and the uh, prosecution services. Uh, this entails overseeing the performance and the responsibilities of all the prosecution can counsel throughout the country. Uh, with regards to the, the decision to charge guidelines, I'm a member of the implementation committee. Uh, this means that uh, I am responsible, together with my committee, other committee members, with rolling out the decision to charge guidelines to all the prosecution council throughout the country. Uh, we are also sensitizing them uh, through online uh, forum uh, on how the decision to charge guidelines should be utilized. Yeah, I was just about to ask you how COVID has affected the rollout. Uh, we are doing just it after uh, this. Yeah, 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 through yeah. the country, but immediately the pandemic. Uh, <laughs> yeah, is, once you get over, yeah, the, yeah. We, we get over. We'll do it uh, now physically. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. We'll get into the discussion, and of course, we start with mm -hmm. Madame. First of all, what is the decision to charge? Am I right in saying that it is the most important decision that a prosecutor has to make? Yes. The decision to charge a must and a decision is the most important decision that a prosecutor can make. But would you allow me to just give a background of this decision Please. to charge yes. the document? Huh? Yeah. Now, we all know that the Constitution of Kenya 2010 uh, but a new paradigm in prosecutorial services in the country. For the first time, it created an independent uh, Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions with powers to direct the, uh, the Inspector General to investigate any matter. The uh, institution that has been created by Article 157 of the Constitution has been given sole state powers to exercise, to, has, has been given solely the power to exercise state powers of prosecution in all courts and in all offenses. Meaning that within the government or within the state, the only institution that can exercise prosecutorial powers is the Office of the Director of Public Prosecution. And allow me also to mention that in exercising the state powers of prosecution, the Constitution provides that the uh, Director of Public Prosecution may initiate criminal proceedings. Mm -hmm. And that is important because it is the it is the justification for discretion in the decision to charge, which means prosecution in Kenya is not mandatory. Mm -hmm. It will depend. That is why the word may under Article 157 is very, very important. Mm -hmm. Secondly, the Constitution provides that in exercising those powers, the director of public prosecutions must have regard to the public interest, avoid abuse of the process of court, and um, also to enhance, enhance and protect human rights. Mm -hmm. 
that is also very important because when we'll be looking at the decision to charge, how we operate the decision to charge, you'll hear about two tests, the evidential test yes. and the public interest test. Yes. It, it is because of this other provision of taking into account the public interest and the interest of the administration of justice and to avoid the abuse of the court process that the idea of the public interest comes in and discretion of the prosecutor comes in. Yeah, let me just take you back to the point where you are part, you are part of the AG's office and yes, now you're independent. Yes, yes. yes. Before the 2010 Constitution, the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions was a department within the Office of the Attorney General. Yes. It was one, I think, of the six departments. Mm -hmm. And at that time, we were only 94 prosecutors, and we only had about 12 field officers. And during that time, the, director, the, director, the Deputy Director of Public Prosecutions then, because the Attorney General was the Director of Public Prosecutions, uh -huh. so the head of the Department of Direct, the Department of Prosecutions was the Deputy Director of Prosecutions. Mm -hmm. And the Deputy Director of Prosecutions, since there was no capacity, we were very few. Mm -hmm. So we could only afford to prosecute in the High Court and in the Court of Appeal, uh -huh. or very, very serious cases in the lower court. And those cases made up only 5% of all the cases in the country. Mm -hmm. it, therefore, the police prosecuted 95% of the cases in the lower court. Mm. And because we did not have a policy on the decision to charge, the police decided, investigated and decided which cases that they took to court, and they also decided what to do with them. So the uh, director of public prosecutions was not aware or was not in charge of all the cases that were, get, that were getting into the system at that time. So um, I think also it explains why we only knew the AG then. Uh, Amos Wako was very famous then. Yes. I think there's a generation that just knew Amos Wako. Because he was the director of no. public prosecution. So he was involved in all cases. Yes. Yes. And again, just from a local, from a, from a Monanchi perspective, a lot of the times we watched Viva Jamakamani mm -hmm. and our understanding of a prosecutor was a, was a policeman. Mm -hmm. So even right now, I believe people don't know that this thing has changed. Because most cases... Yeah. Most cases start in the lower courts. Yes. And in those lower courts, the person who was prosecuting was a was police. The police officer. Mm. So the police officer could investigate, could prosecute, could withdraw. Mm -hmm. The attorney general then, or the director of public prosecutions, would only come in if it was a serious matter or it was on appeal. Mm -hmm. And that time, Kenyans were not very litigious the way they are now. No. So very few cases were getting the limelight. Yeah. It was mostly uh, murder cases, robbery with yeah. violence. We didn't have a all these other cases. Yeah. And that will explain why we had to professionalize prosecution services, because crimes have evolved. You know, initially, when the police were the ones investigating and prosecuting, it was backed by our colonialists. Yes. Most uh, laws were legislated because of the Africans. Mm. And it was m mostly physical offenses. And these were offenses that you could see. There was nothing like uh, um, uh, uh, economic crimes. The very, very, very complex cases that were still very, by law. very honest. Yes. <laughs> and you find that the, the physical offenses that were being um, uh, prosecuted then, they were almost like uh, moral. Offenses that everybody was aware of, yeah. but things have changed. Yeah. yeah, I'm just wondering, Mule, did you practice law then? How was it under the ages? No, I was in the uh, in private practice, ah. but uh, we used to meet, of course, police prosecutors in court. Yeah, they would come and prepare uh, some of the cases you read up in court, whereby maybe somebody had done a decision to say, then the court decide. Yeah, you have a this case, mm. the essential ingredients are not proved. Uh, there is no case here of that this could even be a civil case, yeah. which could not have ended in court. So uh, cases just went, yeah, it went to free. Yeah. yeah, okay. So, Madam, just continue with the history okay. background. Yeah. So now, uh, after the new constitution around 2013, mm -hmm. we realized that we had to take charge mm -hmm. of prosecution in the country. Mm -hmm. And that is how the uh, director of public prosecutions then, he was the chief public prosecutor, before we appointed uh, him the Director of Public Prosecution, Mr. Koryako Tobiko, mm -hmm. decided to professionalize prosecution services by removing police prosecutors and employing mm -hmm. professionals as prosecutors. Yeah. So we took over prosecution from the police and they, they moved out of the courts. Mm -hmm. But we realized, even though we took over prosecutions, we were still being fed by the police. So they were the ones who were making the decision to charge okay. because they were bringing the cases and then we prosecute. Mm -hmm. So we realized that we also had to take over the charging decision so that we could be responsible for the quality of cases that were coming to court mm -hmm. and we'll be sure that we're doing justice to the public mm -hmm. by prosecuting only cases that were prosecutable. Mm -hmm. So you asked me that uh, the decision to charge is the most important decision that a prosecutor can make. Yes, it is. And it, uh, it is because the work of a prosecutor entails 
decision making every day. Mm -hmm. Our work is a decision making decision. You make the decision to charge, you choose the um, offenses, you make the decision uh, about who you will call, mm -hmm. you make the decision about what you're going to disclose, mm -hmm. you make the decision to oppose or not to oppose bail, you make the decision to uh, divert, you make the de so decision to enter into a plea by yeah. bail agreement. So uh, decision making is a constant element that entails the work of a prosecutor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, okay. So I also read somewhere that it is the one function, maybe not, again, I'm, I stand corrected, that speaks to the independence of this office. Yes. The decision to charge. Yes, mm -hmm. because the independence of the prosecutorial services is functional mm -hmm. in the functions that we exercise. So when you're making the decision to charge, you are not supposed to be influenced by any other external yeah. factors, be it political, be it race, be it gender, be it tribe. But you have you seen just... people even online saying that uh, you are not independent enough. I mean, how else do you prove you're independent? And that is the reason why the decision to charge a policy is very important because it requires us to document mm -hmm. and to publicize why we make a decision. Okay. And that is why you realize that when people make noise about the DPP, why he made this decision, when we disclose the evidence that we have, and you realize that we had sufficient evidence with a reasonable prospect of conviction, they don't talk about it mm. because we base our decision on the evidence that we have. Oh, okay. You see, the police will rely on a probable cause in order to arrest. But the fact that you rely on a probable cause to arrest... There's a not probable cause. People... Uh, um, <laughs> help, help. What's a probable cause? <laughs> see, for example, yeah. I come and tell the police that uh, Mr. Mule... I gave Mr. Mule 10,000 shillings to buy for me a camera, mm -hmm. but he did not buy, and therefore he defrauded me. There is a probable cause because I can show that I gave Mule money he has not returned. But now, as a prosecutor, I will have to ask myself, does it meet the threshold of theft or fraud? Because Mule will come up and say, but we had agreed that I will only buy the camera when the cameras are, are available in the, in, the in the market. So there is a reason for you to be arrested but is there a reason for you to be prosecuted? There are other intermediary mm -hmm. factors. Okay. And I will explain to you when I will be telling you the gap between the national prosecution policy that we had before okay. and to date. All right. So then, um, so maybe just a minute. So Steve, did you practice, have you practiced law when this was under the AGs? How was it? My date, but I'm observing what, uh, what is notable is this. Mm -hmm. I think if you look at the decision to charge as we know it today, mm -hmm. one of the single most Benefit, and I agree with senior counsel yeah. that the decision to charge is one of the single most important decisions a prosecution counsel can ever make because it can impact on other rights like the right yeah. to life, freedom, liberty, property, and so on and so forth. But there is a more important, urgent question that these guidelines have now resolved the removal of opaqueness and arbitrariness. You haven't spoken now, English yet. Opaqueness <laughs> and arbitrary. We are speaking <laughs> Speaking well, <laughs> well I, okay, I'm trying to speak in English. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the point is this, yeah. not losing the audience. Mm -hmm. People doubted, remember there was a time when there were genuine and legitimate concern whether the DPP undertook his mandate to persecute or to prosecute. Oh, yes. Because, you know, there was no known formula for arriving at that decision. Mm -hmm. But now there's a calibrated formula and senior counsel was talking about evidential test, public interest test. As a practitioner, and these documents are publicly available, even a Kenyan, a public spirited citizen who just was required to know can access, can access it. This decision to charge guidelines is not some secret document for sensitization hidden somewhere yeah. in the DPP or DPP uh, uh, training institute. No, it's a publicly available document, and you download it and you read it you can see a calibrated formula for arriving at that. And that's, that's why I was saying these are things that must be celebrated because the transformation is real. The DPP of 1991 and the DPP of 2021, in between that time, there's been a lot of transformation and changes that work the benefit of the public. But I think to link it with Article 157, sub Article 6, there was some, I think there's, Observing the conversation around the ship, some, there was some anxiety, let me say unmerited anxiety, whether this decision is shareable or not. If you look at Article 157, sub -article, as sub Article 6, the Constitution provides expressly that the decision to charge 
to, uh, to, to initiate, to institute and undertake criminal proceedings in court is exclusively the DPPs. That has, it has, it has benefit to, it has twin benefits. One, it means that the DPP operates independently without looking behind the shoulders yeah. to see. But it also means for the public that there, there can never be any doubt on whom to hold accountable for the decisions to charge people who are in those courts. We will never hold the police accountable. We will never hold the, I mean, the, the DCI accountable. Once a charge has been registered mm -hmm. and someone has taken plea, the person who is accountable to the court yeah. and to the public is the DPP and the prosecuting officer. I think that clarity is very important. That clarity wasn't clear. And as senior counselor said, when you have professionals in the DPP's office prosecuting only at the high court and at the court of appeal, and then you have police officers making decisions arbitrarily yeah. and in an opaque manner, prosecuting the bulk of the cases at the magistrate's court, even if you wanted to hold someone accountable. How do you hold DPP accountable on appeal at the high court when this matter was prosecuted by a police officer at the magistrate's court? So those are some of the transformations we've seen. Yeah. And I think, uh, I think it's a good thing. It's a good thing. I, yeah. maybe, maybe the last thing to add there is that if that question, if that debate was still ongoing, yeah. I think uh, it was settled in uh, Geoffrey, Geoffrey, Geoffrey Sang ah, versus, yes, versus like DPP. <laughs> Geoffrey, uh, petition number 19 of 2020, there was an occasion for the judiciary to make pronouncement whether the decision to charge, to institute and undertake criminal proceedings is shareable. Okay. And Justice Odunga stated emphatically that that decision and the responsibility for that decision lies strictly and solely with the DPP. Okay. Amule, I bet you've come across this question many times and people yeah. ask it. Isn't that such a heavy undertaking for one office? How do we trust that you will uphold human rights, for example? How do we trust that we are safe with you? Because uh, an assumption is that you're the public lawyer. You, the ODPP represents the public. Yeah. So why do we trust you with this heavy undertaking? Uh, let me start uh, by saying that the guidelines are now ODP in the document which every, every member of the public, uh, all the prosecutors, all the investigating agencies and anybody involved in the criminal can, down, can download and read yeah. and understand. And I must say again, uh, besides the issue of independence, we are independent under the constitution. This is not something in the air. It's under the constitution. It's provided that that is the supreme law. And it is also provided for uh, and other statutes, mm -hmm. uh, the ODPP Act, uh, amongst others. Uh, but you see, for the common person on the road, how do you convince me that I am safe? My rights are safe in your hands as my public lawyer. The, 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 the <laughs> <laughs> say this is one of the benefits of these guidelines. Yeah. We are equipping the lawyers yeah. with the requisite skills and expertise to, to exercise this uh, prosecutorial discretion yeah. of making the decision whether or not to charge an individual person. Yeah. That way, we ensure that the right person is prosecuted, is charged, and subsequently prosecuted for the right offenses. And subsequently, the right person is convicted and sentenced for the right, for the right offenses. So a prosecutor can't just wake up and say, ah, I don't feel, I don't think I like the way you look. No. We are going down. No, there are no parameters. <laughs> to him, yeah. goes, there are no parameters mm -hmm. which the prosecutor will use. Mm -hmm. And these parameters ensure two things. Consistency and certainty. If a prosecutor in Lam is given the same file, and the same file is given to another prosecutor in Busia, the same, let's say five different uh, regions, mm -hmm. the same file, police file is given to the same prosecutor to make a decision. They'll come to the uh, same. They will come to the same uh, yeah. conclusion. Wow. That is what I'm saying. Yeah. Okay. Okay. When I talk of uncertainty, he, uh, I say a prosecutor, when he gets a file, he knows what to look for. Mm -hmm. He knows what factors to consider. Mm -hmm. if, uh, and even uh, as, as this applies to the investigating uh, officer, mm -hmm. before he walks to the office of the prosecutor, they know this is what to expect. Mm -hmm. The prosecutor will not uh, recommend charges if I have not done this. Mm -hmm. If, for example, I have not established the essential ingredients of the offense. And we shall talk about, we'll talk about that when we go yeah. now deeply into uh, the, yeah. to the making of the uh, decision to charge. Yeah. But so, Anita, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. people are operating as if we never had guidelines before. Mm -hmm. The Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions had a prosecution policy document, which almost uh, is in the same terms as this one, 
by 2015. Oh. And we also ha had and still have a general prosecution uh, guideline. And these documents existed and nobody questioned them during that time. I guess it's just about public and, sensitization again. Yes, yeah. about and they expand on the uh, application of prosecut prosecutorial powers based on um, principle of access to justice, human rights, open justice, accountability and transparency. But they were found to be having a gap. The main gap the main gap that led us to uh, uh, to relook at the decision to charge was the fact that the evidential test was not well expounded in the 2015 uh, public prosecution policy. Yeah. And I will give you a quick example because we are short of time. Yeah, yeah. I only just wanted to explain the yeah. evidential test so that my colleagues can also come yes. in. And for the public, the evidential test is the test that you um, undertake to make sure that you have sufficient evidence with a reasonable prospect of conviction. I will give you an example. We have talked about the two tests. The evidential test will talk about the public interest test. Mm -hmm. In the evidential test, it is in the statute. It is either common law or it is in the statute, what the offense is. So the offense is defined and the punishment is defined and the ingredients of that offense are also defined. Mm -hmm. Now, for example, in the evidential test, the prosecutor will have to make sure, like in any other criminal case, that there is the actor's rules and there is the mens rea. That means you that... You have me. <laughs> I'm going to explain. Now, I'm going to explain. Yeah. Okay. In all the facts that the police will collect from the field, the prosecutor will have to satisfy herself or himself that the person who is the suspect committed the offense in that he did the act. Mm -hmm. And in looking at the actor's reels, there are, for example, four elements you look at. You have done the act. If it is murder, yeah. you, you, you pull the trigger or you used a panga or you whatever, the, yeah. you did the act. But other than that, the circumstances under which you did the act. That is yeah. actor's rules because it is something that can be seen. It is external. Actor's rules is external. You did the act, you cut the person with a panga. The circumstances, like it is in this house, it is in a hotel, you did this. And then the result, the resultant yeah. uh, 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 consequence of that act. For example, if it is murder, it is the death of the person. Mm. And then we also look at the, the circumstances. The circumstances. So you look at whether you did the act, the circumstances, and then the results. Mm. It does not mean that if you did not do the act, you cannot be uh, held accountable and you will explain. Mm -hmm. So that is one element of the evidential test. The other one is the intention. Because in a criminal case, that is the actor's rules and the mens rea. So the actor's rules is the external one, what people can see. Okay. You have done it in these circumstances and this is the result. Mm. Now the mens rea is the intention. And sometimes you see they say um, uh, intentionally, fraudulently. Mm. We want to look at your mind using external factors. Mm. So actors use as external, uh, uh, mens rea is internal. internal. Okay. Now, it is the one of the yeah. that when you come with the actors' rules, you've already uh, proved the actors' rules, they have to go back and look at the element. Did you intend? Mm. And that is why we say prosecution is not scientific. Mm -hmm. And that is where you need to make the decision to charge because you can have the external element, but you have to make sure did the person have an intention to commit the crime. The crime. Other than strict liability offenses, mm -hmm. for example, not paying taxes, mm -hmm. where you cannot say that I did not intend. Where the law, the, it is the conduct that has been um, criminalized. Mm -hmm. For example, driving without a driving license, strict liability because you did not have it. You cannot say that I did not intend. Mm -hmm. So you can see it is not a very easy test to apply. It's and not. we must guide the young prosecutors. Yes. For example, in a murder case, you can have all the external ones, the actors rules, you pulled the trigger, I know the circumstances, I know the results. The law requires me to uh, subject the suspect to a medical test to make sure that... Mental assessment. Yeah. Mental assessment. Yeah. Because if, that test, if I fail that test, then irrespective of what I have here, the person will not be responsible. Yeah. And those are the intricacies that the prosecutor that must deal at, with. Yeah. Yes. Okay, I just ask you, Amaida, um, mm. you were involved in this process, I believe, from the onset. Mm. What informed IJM to get involved in this process? So IJM is a global organization, and in every country that we have a presence, we'll take one form of violence as it appears in the community. Mm -hmm. And then we bring in lawyers and uh, other criminal justice actors, and we support people through the criminal justice system. Okay. As we are representing people, we are assessing where the outflow is in the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. If you look at it as a pipeline, what's the thing that's causing the leak? Mm -hmm. To make sure that if an injustice comes into the justice system, it delivers on justice. Mm -hmm. 
And from then, our experiences representing people over a period of time, we partnered with the Office of the Director of Public Prosecution because, as Madam Senior Counsel is saying, they were taking a big leap. In 2013-2014, as they were moving into the independent office, they moved from 94 prosecutors and did a mass hire in a single stroke. They were the largest oh, well, yeah. Yeah. in this country. Mm -hmm. They hired 540 prosecutors. Wow. So from a team that had seasoned experience at the high court, who are senior, who are lawyers, and then you add in another group, and then you're sending them out to the field and saying, take over these files and take over prosecution. How did that work? I mean, there were these seasoned cops who were prosecutors, and then one mm -hmm. day you tell them, hand over to a youngling the file, they should continue. How, how did this work? As you would expect, there were complexities to that transition, and it's institutional complexities, it is criminal justice and even the practice of criminal justice. Yeah. And even development of crimes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. There was um, police prosecutors who were vastly experienced. Yes. People who could run a prosecution, you know. From end to end. From end to end without much thought. Yeah. And then we are hiring lawyers. And there isn't a training school for prosecutors. Yeah. So we are hiring legal counsel and then appointing them as prosecution counsel and saying go out in the field. Mm -hmm. It then became a very necessary thing even to support their relationship with their investigators and police officers uh -huh. to create a consistent way in which this decision to charge is being made. Uh -huh. And so around that 2014 time, as they headed out to the field, the DPP's office um, suggested a study on how the decision to charge is being made. Uh -huh. And so in 2015, 2016, we went around eight stations across the country uh, with the team from ODPP. These stations were picked for different reasons. Uh, the kind of cases they were having, busy court stations, yeah. some uh, transit stations, for instance, VOI, so mm -hmm. you have local crime as it appears oh, yeah. in that area. In then you have the ones who are passing mm -hmm. by, so you have road traffic, you have highway crime. Yeah. And so we picked various cases for va various court stations for various reasons. Meru, because it had a high number of originating murder trials at the high court. Okay. So also assessing how the office supports prosecutors who are still in the high court. When we assessed uh, the making of the decision to charge and how it was done, actually, because it's a justice study, so unlike a health study where you, you know, check for ARVs distributed, <laughs> were shots taken, this was a review of files. Mm -hmm. So we called oh. for registers mm. from these stations, and the registers, because the registers are manual books, we had to count the number of cases, because we're looking for cases from November 2014, so I believe September 2015, which is when the new prosecutors had gone yeah. out into the field. So we counted um, all the cases that had originated during that period, assessed how many we wanted to review, went to those individual stations, requested police officers, because prosecutors had no files, requested police officers to produce those files at the prosecution offices, opened every single one and assessed whether there was sufficient evidence in each one that of those cases. <laughs> it was truly an adventure. <laughs> an adventure. Yeah. It was uh, difficult, but what it did, and I think that was what was critical for the prosecution office, even as they moved to then streamline how the decision char to charge is made, it made the office aware of what is the experience of this prosecutor you have sent out to the field? Because okay. again, you remember the bulk of the prosecutors who are present in the office had been high court prosecutors. Yeah. They were not lower the court. Lower court uh, yeah. So they were not moving mm. at that level and experiencing those kind of yeah. cases. Out of the files we reviewed, so the registers had about 10,000 files. We reviewed a bit more than 600. Mm. Out of the files that we reviewed, mm. 100, all those files had 109 offenses. And so, as she was talking about, so murder, theft, mm -hmm. uh, robbery, 109. But 12 offenses were repeated 68% of the time. Wow. Now, why that's important is because it tells you what your routine offenses mm. are. Yeah. So that you ease the work of a prosecutor, mm. even as you think through what guidelines are you giving them for their work, let me make it easier for you around the cases that are going to be routine. Yeah. So we had law and order offenses that were routine, Idol and disorderly, drunk and disorderly, creating loitering, and you know, you have offenses that are yeah. Yeah. Mm. Then you have the ones which are tied to property. There was yeah. stock theft, there was yeah. stealing, there was theft by servant, there's robbery, violence, burglary. Those appeared repeatedly. And then the ones against people, assault, causing mm. grievous harm, causing bodily harm, grievous harm, and defilement. 
those were the 12 offenses that repeated themselves the most time. Okay. The other things that came out from the study, the relationship between the prosecutors and the investigator, mm -hmm. the dynamic around uh, what I have in my file as a prosecutor, what the investigator has as their file, my access as a prosecutor to the file in order to prepare, because I cannot be receiving the file this morning and headed and to, to court the yeah. next day. Mm -hmm. And then even just a streamlining of operations. Mm -hmm. If then you're aware that this number of offenses repeat themselves the bulk of the time, is the workflow for people to handle these routine offenses. Mm -hmm. And routine, I say, um, you know, with reservation, because these are critical life decisions for people. Yeah. So is what it means for a prosecutor to handle this, so that you spend enough time preparing them for the cases that they will not have much And of course, experience that of. showed up during All for Justice, when the DPP yes. came in and... Uh, even when we went about around 20 prisons, and you can talk to that. Let me talk about that. So, what All for Justice was is the DPP and the team from the prosecution office, Madam SPP, went around prisons. Mm -hmm. So, of course, the irony being the prosecutor decided why you should be here. And now they came and they were And so they came and asked them, you know, why are you here? Why have yeah. you taken so long? And it also spoke to yeah. the limitations on bail and bond. Mm -hmm. It spoke to if you have such. Many petty offenses. Again, for like the majority of cases, they thirty-four percent of them were ending up with a guilty plea. So yeah. if you have so many people who are willing to say yes, I did it, why go through the system as opposed to encourage them to bargain out at the start? Yeah. So that we use the Make system to deal with yeah. emergent crimes that are starting to weigh down That's the economy, yeah. they are weighing down our communities, yeah. they are weighing out everything around us. Because the mm -hmm. more severe crimes require more attention, require more specialization. And I'd just like Tomika to speak to that a bit. Transnational crimes, I mean, what are they first of all? Why should I care that they exist as a common citizen? Well, transnational uh, crimes are ones that cross borders. Mm -hmm. um, they are crimes like narcotics trafficking, human trafficking, wildlife trafficking, mm -hmm. corruption, mm -hmm. money Terrorism. laundering. Mm -hmm. So they might occur in Kenya, but the ramifications, the consequences reach far beyond that. Mm -hmm. um, it, for example, uh, money laundering often happens because you take and commit a crime in Kenya and the proceeds are going to, else. to somewhere else, yeah. whether it's the United States or the UK or anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. So the impact isn't just in a single country, it, it, crosses, it crosses boundaries. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the reason why the decision to charge is so critically yeah. important, because it doesn't just impact Kenyan citizens, mm -hmm. yeah. but it, it, it impacts both foreign nationals who are living here, yeah. working here, want to invest here, and also other individuals and businesses and other countries across the world. That yeah. Mr. Mule is talking about. You not only have to ensure it's not guesswalk. It's, it's not, not guesswalk. Guess it isn't. Mm -hmm. And 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 conviction mm -hmm. and sustain that conviction on appeal. And Tomika, you're right because I, I, I was going to request Anita mm -hmm. uh, that Steve, as a uh, as a private um, a lawyer or as a practitioner, yeah. one of the things that the decision to charge has done is that we document the evidence we rely on Absolutely. when you're making the decision mm -hmm. to charge. Yeah. And then the requirement by law and the insistence by the DPP that before we make the decision to charge, suspects must be given an opportunity to write a statement under inquiry or a charge and cautionary statement. Mm -hmm. And further, the fact that now we are required to disclose. How the disclosure of evidence, how does that work? How does, and I even have a, a rider to that. Yes. Why you write? Now that, that, now that everything is tabled, everything yes. is on the table, but has yes. it changed how you do your work? The importance of that, yeah. yeah. The information is very perverse in the sense that I just don't think defense lawyers really understand this, but it's very important that defense lawyers and even the public understand this so that they interplay with how they have the connection yeah. between the prosecution and for making the decision and the input of the suspect. In that decision, yeah. because you may not think that the suspect was oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> Did he lose all that? <laughs> Did it? <laughs> oh, sorry. Sorry, yeah, that yeah. again. Yeah. yeah, but at least our question was hard. Yeah. As an accountability tool, mm -hmm. the decision to charge necessarily means that once the prosecution counsel receives the inquiry and the investigation file, he reviews the evidence of that one, mm -hmm. and he has to satisfy himself that this evidence. This is a prima facie case. What is that a prima facie case? A case that you get a delayed complete protection. Okay. But I think the more important element or aspect in the child is the input of the suspect. And more often than not, 
the public have not really updated their mindset mm -hmm. about how they view the DPP. And the defense lawyer sometimes sabotage the interest, maybe inadvertently, yeah. the interest of the suspect. Because you see, the DPP must satisfy himself that this file, the investigation file, in as much as it's permissible or possible, contains both, of course, incriminating material, yeah. but also exculpatory. Yes. Mm -hmm. How do you get exculpatory or uh, material that is exonerating mm -hmm. if you don't require the suspect to record a statement? Yeah. If a suspect is going to record a statement, I want to ask them, I mean, there's no investment for honesty. You see, the Constitution binds the DPP to make his decision in good faith. Yes. Mm -hmm. At Article 157, Article 10, He's bound by that. Why, why they confirm the exclusive mandates to make the decision to charge and to undertake the proceedings? It's also required to act in good faith. And we must, at the first instance, presume the law requires it. Yeah. That the, we must presume that the DPP is acting in good faith. Good faith, yeah. How does the DPP complete his review if the suspect statement is not there? Yeah. How does the suspect help the DPP reach an honest, defensible position to charge you mm -hmm. if you are withholding information? Yeah. We know it's by the transformation really yes. the government life. Yes. How does how does a person who has another fight the public? If you are arrested and, it, uh, and you've been arraigned in court and that decision which is going to be made during the investigation, mm -hmm. so as much as possible, don't you say mm -hmm. no one is to accuse himself except before the law. Mm -hmm. Yes. And you're not required to help the prosecution and ask them this part. But you have a corresponding obligation to prefer an honest statement mm -hmm. yes. because it can help it can, it can make things easier for you the dpp mm -hmm. and and because as to, to make a, you'll speak to this and because it is the the responsibility of the prosecutor to prove their case beyond reasonable doubt. Yeah. And beyond reasonable doubt if you only have one side of the story yeah. then you disadvantage yeah yes but, but then also once you are given a honest statement the investigating officers must also do better to make sure that all the facts are right. I see a lot of files being required, and it's in the public domain. Mm -hmm. You go to court, the prosecution will say, we are not registered in this charges mm -hmm. because they have requested the investigating officer to complete or to cover some areas. Yeah. And you see, for instance, mm -hmm. the DPP is taking that, yes, a file was forwarded to me, I returned it so that certain critical aspects be covered. Because when that decision is made, the public will hold the DPP accountable yes. for that decision. Yes. You must be sure, if you want to hold the DPP about the two ways of doing it. If you believe that the decision to charge, despite everything, was still yeah. made in error, mm -hmm. because you see, it's a decision which impacts some discretion. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it does not, even judges, have the fact, there's no need for appeal mm -hmm. if judges can't make honest mistakes. Yeah. So sometimes even the DPP acting in good faith may make an honest mistake. And mm -hmm. the way to go about it, mm -hmm. the opportunity like that, and, and this and this guidance provides for mechanism. For well, continuous yeah. review of the yeah. case. Yeah. They can review them on their own motion, but you can also trigger the review by your yeah. right. Yeah. I mean, if Kenyans want to see the good thing, they can see the good things. But if you want to be sure that the man is the time, yeah. 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 for review. Yeah. And I think let us also not be suspicious yeah. when the DP, because even when the DPP reviews this decision, child, it benefits the public. Mm -hmm. Because we already said he acts in the public interest. If we see Charges registered and then a review is made and charges terminated. Instead of celebrating <laughs> that the DPP is animating, <laughs> the yes. we become suspicious of what was in Why, what, what yeah. yeah. and dealings. Yes. I think that is the kind of suspicion that does the inspire confidence. And you see, but then there is, okay, fine, there is a constitutional underpinning, as I want to say, <laughs> you can do without this, but there's a constitutional underpinning <laughs> for this kind of conversation. Yeah. Look at hotel, public participation, and all that. The DPP is trying to do his best. Nobody has gone to court to extract an order mm -hmm. to require the DPP to run this cafe. No. But they're thinking <laughs> that what we have to do is to make the part. And it's a good thing. So we must first of all recognize the transformation that is going on as the same as an accused, as a suspect. And I already said in my opening remarks that there's a majority of Kenyans who come into contact with the Department of Justice for the first time. Yes. They have never been inside court. They don't know what it means to be arrested. They don't know about pretrial detention. They don't know about bail. Yeah. What bond? About charges. Yet you've been running it that he told us off the cuff yeah. that before we started that this is like the seventh, the ninth, the ninth yeah. yeah. And you covered a lot of everything during bail. Yes. That has happened. Now today they are telling the public 
Should you come into contact with the criminal justice system, do not be afraid. Do not hold back information that can lead to a decision that excludes you from the criminal justice system. And and Anita, 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 let me just add something. Mm -hmm. One of the benefits of the decision to charge is that we are insisting on the rights of the victim also. Mm -hmm. Because when you're making the decision to charge, you also ask yourself, is there anything that you can salvage to mitigate the position of the victim? Mm -hmm. And therefore, prosecutors are required to apply ancillary orders to investigate and trace proceeds of crime so that the suspects do not benefit from crime. Yeah. So you find that as you make the decision to charge their alternative to prosecution, that is plea bargaining, sometimes with a view to mm -hmm. re, re, uh, restituting to the victim mm -hmm. what was uh, stolen from mm -hmm. them or what they did, what the, uh, the, they lost during the commission yeah. of crime. And I think it is very important for victims to realize that internationally they become active participants in the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. And just being by active participants, not just to make sure that the person is convicted, but also to make sure that whatever we can recover and restore, asset forfeiture and confiscation is done as mm -hmm. quickly as possible and at the earliest opportunity. Yeah. Yes, Tomika. And I think it's also really important to um, acknowledge that the prosecutors, you're not making these decisions in a vacuum. They're getting information from the investigators. And so when that decision is being made that there's additional information that's needed, it's that cooperation yeah. with yeah. the investigators yeah. that's so critical so that the prosecutor can have that open and honest yeah. conversation yeah. Yeah. about this is what we need to prove this case in court. Yeah. This is the instructions that we need to give in order to get that evidence. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that's where that sort of prosecution investigator relationship plays such a critical role. Yeah. That decision to charge lies with the prosecutor, but that investigator is needed. It's, in a, whole system. System. it's a whole yes. system point of view so yeah. that when the ODPP brings a case to court, that the judge who gets it is going to know this case is ready to go yeah. Yeah. with this full team working yeah. hand in yes. hand with one another. Yes. And I think that the guidelines really do speak yes. to that. Yeah. And before we get to the guidelines, I just want you to take us to the criminal justice system. There's always mm -hmm. this, we don't know who does what. Okay. Yeah. You know, so when a case goes out, I know actually everything, the backstop of the DPP. Like any, anything, just tell us, take us through that. So let me describe it as a pipeline. Yes. I'll start with the pipeline model yeah. because we use it to describe. You see a pipe like this. Something is coming in, something is coming out. So yeah. your pipe which has water, you know, as you're walking through a building and someone is washing, and then the pipe has holes, and then you know, the, the places where water spills on you, yeah. keep that in mind as the criminal justice mm -hmm. system. So what comes in is forms of injustice, mm -hmm. some form of violence, some yeah. form uh, of violence within the community that amounts to an offense. Mm -hmm. So I remember SPP was trying to describe actus rias and uh, mens rias. So let me explain it <laughs> using Steve's water. Yeah. So Steve has a bottle of water. I take his water. Yeah. That is the act, yes. the criminal act. Yes. I take his water with the intent to permanently deprive him of it. Mm -hmm. That is my intention. Yes, this is uh, the guilty mind. Yeah. That amounts, this is an act I have done here. That amounts to an offense of theft. Mm -hmm. So then Steve will go to a police and say, my water was stolen. stolen. A police officer will investigate. Mm -hmm. The investigation process is the starting point. So they investigate and verify that he did have water. He had water where he said the water was. Mm -hmm. The water was taken and he identifies me as, as the person to the exclusion of all others yeah. who took that water. Mm -hmm. That's the investigation process. Mm -hmm. Once that investigation is complete, and the investigator is and satisfied. And the agency specific to this role. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. And it's the first step of the pipeline. Yes. Once mm -hmm. the investigator is satisfied, I have concluded Steve owned water. Steve's water was taken. Steve's water was taken by Amaida. She intended to never return it to mm -hmm. him. He will write that down and take it to a prosecutor. Mm -hmm. So he has then completed his investigation. Mm -hmm. That file is brought to a prosecutor. Mm -hmm. Now, with the decision to charge, the prosecutor must assess everything in the file yeah. to address two things. Is there sufficient evidence? I will let Mule speak to that. And speak of the system. The sufficient <laughs> yeah. thing, uh, come in, I won't stop. Yeah. I'll just give to the example of yeah. this case. So the sufficient of, uh, sufficiency of the evidence is tied to how the law has described that particular offense. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you're hitting the ingredients and then what the evidence law requires. Mm -hmm. That I have information that is relevant, admissible. Let's say had recorded a statement 
and her, she only talked about her presence in the room, but she hasn't said anything about the water. water. Yeah. That mm. is not relevant. Yeah. It does not okay. need to come into. Mm -hmm. So that's what a prosecutor is looking at. What has been put in this file, mm -hmm. that do all of them check through? And the guidelines have listed out all these things. This is key evidence. Then the prosecutor is satisfied that there is sufficient evidence, and then he's satisfied that this offense is in the public interest to prosecute. But I am not wasting public resources. Yeah. Mm. However, it is in the in the good of the wider administration of justice. Mm -hmm. Not because, for instance, Steve went on Twitter and said my water was stolen. <laughs> no. That is public outcry, yeah. not public interest. <laughs> right. We're talking about public yeah. interest yeah. in the wider administration of yeah. justice. Mm -hmm. It serves the criminal justice system that yeah. will prosecute this matter. Mm -hmm. So as a prosecutor, they make a decision and mm -hmm. say, I will charge this person. Please arrest from either. We are now moving into the chain of prosecution. Yes. Because then a decision to charge has, has been, been made. made. But the decision to charge is a continuous decision. Okay. Yes. Tomorrow when we appear in court, as a prosecutor, I'm deciding to continue a prosecution. Mm -hmm. Every day the case appears in court, mm -hmm. I am making a decision continuous. to continue. Okay. Because if something happens along the way, for instance, Maida says to Steve, I'll give you back your water. Yeah. Let's stop this fight. So yeah, then yeah. a prosecutor should take these new emerging circumstances yeah. and then make a decision either not to prosecute on the basis of an agreement, on a basis mm. of payment, mm -hmm. on the basis of and there is this is why uh -huh. setting up guidelines for the prosecution office is critical because the office is saying Despite what the environment is, including mischievous yeah. lawyers, despite that environment, <laughs> as a prosecution office, we want to be held accountable to yeah. this. Yes. That every person you have seen come into court, we have made a conscious, they didn't fall, they didn't wake up and fall in court. Yeah. I have made a conscious, conscious decision, decision as a prosecutor. I've made a decision that irrespective of whether it was done here in Nairobi, was done in Eldoret, was done in Mombasa, is consistently done. Mm. It is not, not done on the whims of an individual. Mm. It is not done to punish a certain person. But I can look at it and know it was consistently done. And part mm -hmm. of how you know it's consistently done is you develop how the decision is made in terms of the um, instruction around mm -hmm. it, but also where. Mm -hmm. And so the guidelines create forms. Mm -hmm. So that all I need to do is not just randomly believe what was on someone's mind, but someone has put their mind on paper. Mm -hmm. There is a form that indicates I have reviewed this evidence and I'm satisfied. What if I'm not satisfied with either? So the making of the decision to charge is the institution of prosecution and determination of prosecution. So if you're not satisfied mm -hmm. with, as a prosecutor, yeah. what you have received as evidence. Yes. And this was actually part of where the greatest conflict came between mm -hmm. prosecutors and investigators. When a prosecutor says they're not satisfied, they give back the file to the yeah. investigator. Yeah. But the feedback, for instance, we got during the study was investigators are saying, the file has been rejected, but I'm not being told why. But you see, when you have guidelines ah, that explain mm -hmm. to you why, mm -hmm. and you also have required a prosecutor to say why, so you're not giving an investigator a file, and it would appear yeah. really disrespect, mm -hmm. but you're saying, go build up on these three lines of inquiry that still did not enough have mm -hmm. enough uh, information but, uh, on this particular thing. But by the, also, even before we filed the case in court, I think maybe Tommy or uh, Steve can speak about the decision to charge also provides for alternatives to trial and alternatives to prosecution yeah. and how we treat the vulnerable in the society. Mm -hmm. And people are not looking at that because now we have the diversion policy, we have the plea yeah. bargaining. Still, I do not know how well. they... Yeah. But in the decision to charge, you know, when you're making the... You might not make the... De when you're making the decision to charge, you will decide either to go to trial, mm -hmm. you can divert, you can... Uh, uh, yeah. you the alternative... Can, uh, or yeah, alternative to trial yeah. and alternative to prosecution. Yeah. Which I think defense counsel sometimes misunderstand. Maybe in another session, yeah. we need to have a focus on the defense trial, the defense at all. Because sometimes, as I said, well, we should, I, yeah. I, I appear in those courts, yeah, and I see sometimes we are somewhat in the interest of their clients. Mm -hmm. You see, I already assume that we have covered in the other cities um, a discussion on the immersion. Yes, yeah, we have, and, yes. And, 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 yes. and, and I think. This is what I can say in terms of animating courtroom experience and those who are watching should take note here. Yeah? Usually the procedure is after you've taken plea, mm -hmm. primarily you ask for reasonable bail terms, which mm -hmm. most of the times the prosecutor person never opposes. And you also ask to be supplied with documentary evidence with the prosecution counsel intends to rely on mm -hmm. the standard. But I think now I want to ask the public to raise your hand so that you can confer with your lawyer 
or at least ask permission to address the court directly say, can I speak? Mm. I, in this particular case, although I've taken plea, or even before I take plea, I have not recorded my statement. Oh, yeah. Am I going to get an opportunity to record a statement? Or, although I recorded a statement, do I have an opportunity to review that statement? Mm -hmm. Or, I have something significant. So always keep on confiding the law and pay the attention of the court. Mm -hmm. it because they can allow. Yeah. Sometimes, yeah. you see, what happens in court is this. You may have something you want to communicate to the prosecution counsel. But then your lawyer is there and lawyer is not taking the cue. Mm -hmm. But once your case has been mentioned, you see the prosecution counsel has so many files. Yeah. The yeah. They call this file, you move the dog, the court deals with it, and the file is called, then you leave. Most of the time, accused persons don't, don't sit back to wait for the prosecution counsel. And even if they do, the prosecution counsel, like, oh, I hope civil counsel, you can encourage all of them not to be afraid to come into contact with the, with the accused persons. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes in the corridors, they, they, they're a bit cautious. In fact, in the decision to charge, there is a whole paragraph of how a prosecutor should treat a an suspect accused. or an accused person that is unrepresented. Oh, yes. Because you are the custodian of the process. Yeah. Yeah. And you must make sure that it is fair. They are cautious and say, no, if I'm seen with this accused person, probably I'll be accused of yeah. taking, taking money. To, no, no, I think for this decision to charge to be animated and to, for us to extract the full benefit that it has, there must be some communication channels that remain open. Yeah, yeah. And if the defense attorney is trying to block that, I want to encourage a case person to go directly to, to, the, to the prosecution yes. counsel. <laughs> yeah. 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 And I don't know if I terminate, if I, if I request that the prosecution terminate this case, how will I get my field? Mm. You know, I think that that's question here at some point. You know what? what happens to defense lawyers, for example, when you go to alternative ways of uh, settling? Yeah, the idea being not to put money first, yeah. you have to be innocent and find other ways. Personally, my mm. experience is this. Mm. If a case is fit for the impression, yeah. I will allow the prosecution counsel. That's good. Because permitted under the law. Yeah. It's permitted. If mm -hmm. a case is fit for people again, mm -hmm. yes. I would allow the prosecution counsel to be planned for people again. Yeah. Yeah. Which means admit to an offense, mm -hmm. and then the prosecution exercise of discretion cannot go to yeah. Whatever the circumstances, if there's some new evidence that we might have spoke to it, I will always allow Then fees will come later. Okay. I can't sabotage it. <laughs> <laughs> Because, uh, I want the prosecution yeah. counsels to also be, be alert. Yes. Be alert, and as, 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 we, as we all know, you keep on evaluating. Sometimes evaluation means also look at the demeanor of the accused. But sometimes you put someone on the door, and they genuinely look surprised that they're in court. <laughs> yeah. 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 They're trying to relate to this offense, they can't. I think it can trigger some review. Mm. I know, ordinarily, because they handle many files in court. Mm. It's not humanly possible to always go back with the same because you go back to your desk, there are new files to review because they have to be in court. Yeah. But I hope that they get to find time yeah. to look at the demeanor of people. <laughs> Look at this. I, want to I want us to complete the system, the, the legal justice system, and then quickly, Mule, if you could just take us through what exactly what you look at when what you make the initial at. charge. Okay. Then we have to go social. So make it quick okay. and short. Okay. So first, I must say something to what you know, Steve is yeah. giving as advice to prosecutors. That has also been prescribed in the guidelines. Yeah. Yeah. It is a sixth consideration yeah. when you're taking the evidential test. Yes. In every file a prosecutor is making a decision on, the accused statement must be present. Yeah. So you're not coming into court blind so that uh, the day the accused finally speaks, they say, actually, I have a twin brother. It was him yeah. there. I, I have that question. And so not, <laughs> the, the, the element of surprise is lost, is it? When you're doing, when you have everything on the table. So what, yeah. what, what do you play? What's no, happening? actually, there's a lot. Because the element of surprise, what you reduce is the element of crisis. But surprise <laughs> happens in every human interaction. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Even as someone has recorded a statement, how they recall it two years later and they are presenting mm -hmm. it is very different. One thing which they did not think was significant can pop up in court and it swings your case to these parts describe a different offense 
but a twist to the offense that requires you to then review what you charge yeah. the person for. Yeah. So there will always be a surprise. It really is sometimes like the uh, legal drama. Mm -hmm. So you asked me to yeah. from the, 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 yes, the system. So once the prosecutor has made a decision and yeah. I said it's a continuing decision, they then prosecute that case. When they have completed their case and the defense has gotten an opportunity to respond to what has been uh, raised to accuse them, and in this case, Gyojaman Kamani is their process. Yes. Umanise, Wendele, and then the court makes it, to it determination. So yeah. the court then takes what has been presented to it. So the court can also just say it is the evidence you provided, in as much as you thought it was okay, the court has the discretion to say, it, it was not enough. So theirs is not even discretion. discretion. Mm. It is their standard. Oh, so okay. as a prosecutor, the standard you have when making the decision to charge is a reasonable prospect of conviction. Ah. That reasonable, reasonable. All these things I it's have, okay. if I place them before the court, yes. then reasonably the court they can convict. agree to mm. convict. But then you go to court and something happens. Yeah. Witnesses don't show up. Yeah. An IO is transferred. So yeah. you have a separate IO who perhaps does not discharge with the taking of the testimony. Investigating officer. Investigating officer. So <laughs> that person maybe does not discharge with uh, delivering the testimony in the way that you would have liked. Yeah. So what the court hears is not always what's in the file. Uh -huh. Because humans then say to the court what their experiences mm -hmm. were. Not just what was written. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, but and the people the courts can also call evidence. Yes. If they find yeah. there is something important oh, that okay. has been done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the court can call evidence. The court can also, as it continues to hear, suspect that this amounts to a different offense mm -hmm. and even give indication in that yeah. direction and mm -hmm. move some of the matters in that direction. Sometimes they can also ask whether the parties would like to resolve this outside of because ah, the nature okay, of the okay. offense yeah. Yeah. would actually be resolved outside, outside of the, court. the full trial mm -hmm. process. But then the court puts its mind to the facts that have been placed in point. Yeah. Yeah by the prosecution representing the state mm -hmm. as the people with sole state powers of prosecution, mm -hmm. which is the DPP and whoever he has delegated in court. And the accused person responding Why to that... Why do you think that, Steve? They must have their representation. Okay, yeah. It's actually a thing, even the country... And the criminal justice system is progressively working towards sure, to make sure yeah. there's legal representation. So the court puts its mind its minds to the facts and then makes a determination, which is a judgment. It says my particular na makosa. So the particular na makosa is we have convicted you yeah. by law, and when you are told, cry for yourself. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. your mitigation and after you mitigate mm -hmm. and you know that's why now you run yeah. from your job come on you can keep quiet you can yeah. come across yeah. you can go and so on and so once you give that the mm -hmm. court then sentences you determines okay. what the penalty as the prescription of the law and their own sentencing guidelines based on whether you're a first time offender second time offender the impact of that particular offense to the victim and also to the community. Mm -hmm. They make a decision and they give you your 10 years, your 20 yeah. years, your life. Whatever they have yeah. discretion. Mm -hmm. okay. discretion. So that's the criminal justice, justice system. system. So it's very important to note, I think, to the public that the deputy doesn't operate in a vacuum. No. Yeah. Mm -hmm. they, it's a whole pipeline. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Whole pipeline. Yeah. And actually the benefit in sharing the process to the other actors in the criminal justice system is saying that I recognize as the office of the director of public prosecution that the work I, um, or the mandate I have been given by the people in the Republic is a very intrusive one. Yeah. Someone seated here, senior counsel can be seated here, get a file in my name and say, go arrest her. Yeah. Someone will come to my house, they don't need to knock, they yeah. come in, take me in, in whatever means, lock me up and detain or me. block your bank account. Without yeah. telling me, or block your yeah. bank account, mm -hmm. uh, put me in the press, affect my reputation. Mm -hmm. That decision is very intrusive. It's yeah. actually the interference, it's where state power and individual rights come into contact yeah. at any given mm -hmm. point. Uh -huh. And so the person who makes that decision, we must be very careful to make sure we know how they make that decision. We know who has that the power, the power the and how they make it and how they are holding each other accountable. So quickly, Mule, you must tell us what yes. you look at. Let me start by saying, continuing from the, yes. the pipe. Yes. And the making of the decision to charge is part of the process in the pipe. Yes. So we, are, we start from the uh, 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 situation whereby an investigating officer takes a police file, mm -hmm. or an investigation file to a prosecutor. Mm -hmm. Now, 
a police file has got 10 sub files marked sub file A to J. Okay. Let me not go to the 10 sub files. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, there yeah. are 10 sub files and all of them are very important. Yeah. So the prosecutor gets the file mm -hmm. and considers what you have now had. Is there a prosecutable case with a realistic prospect of a conviction by a court of law? Mm -hmm. So that the prosecutor to determine this question and will, a court of law properly guided. A, pro, a court of law properly guided. Okay. So what is a realistic prospect of a uh, of a conviction? Mm -hmm. The prosecutor will consider whether a court of law properly constituted, applying the law, taking into account all the evidence and all the circumstances, mm -hmm. will return a verdict of guilty. Mm -hmm. Now, how does a court return a verdict of guilty? Mm -hmm. The court received uh, receives evidence yeah. Yeah. beyond reasonable doubt. doubt. Okay. How does the prosecutor yeah. establish evidence beyond reasonable doubt? Yeah. By proving all the essential ingredients of the offense for which the accused person has been charged in court. Yeah. At that stage, the prosecutor applies what now you have had as yeah. a two test. Yeah. And the first test, very critical one, which is objective, uh, the prosecutor may not have a lot of discretion, is the evidential test. Yeah. And there are six conditions which the prosecutor looks at. For the sake of time, let me yeah, the evidence. Please. <laughs> Is the evidence available? Mm -hmm. Do we have it? Uh, let's say, do you have witnesses? Are they out of the country? Uh, perishable experts, at, uh, let's say, like wildlife, mm -hmm. uh, meat, dealing with... Uh, 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 yeah, yeah. Are they gone? Yeah. Is it available? It's a consideration. Shall we have the evidence? Because the court will require experts. Uh, admissibility. Is the evidence admissible? Uh, let me give an example of confessions. People confess, but there are confession rules. Mm -hmm. Which guide investigators on how to obtain a confession? Admissible means what? Is it acceptable? Uh, acceptable. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. So if the if the confession was not obtained uh, properly in accordance with the confession rule, it is not admissible. The prosecutor will say. So you can't come and record me in secret and use it mm, against me. No. I must know. You, you yeah. talked recently about uh, a, a, a gentleman who who recorded the wife. Yeah. Going yeah. 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 The wife yeah. 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 It was yeah. illegally yeah. obtained and then oh, the rules. So last week. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Then you go to relevant. Mm -hmm. Is the evidence relevant? Does it establish the essential ingredients? Yeah. Then you go to reliability. Reliability, we are talking about trust with the witnesses. Mm -hmm. Is this a victim who has come to court just to set to settle scores mm -hmm. out of the data or something? Yeah. And then credible. Is it a witness who has lied before court before? Mm -hmm. And then the last one is the strength of rebuttal evidence. What is rebuttal? This is where we are talking about the explanation which the suspect gives. Mm -hmm. And we mm -hmm. must get a statement under inquiry or a normal statement or a cautionary statement from the suspect so that we know his, expression, his explanation. Uh, why did he co uh, commit this? And what is the basis of this? Uh, the, the basis of this uh, is provided for under the penal court. Mm -hmm. Criminal responsibility. Criminal liability. Mm -hmm. And there are some circumstances which can make a, this is a suspect mm -hmm. he committed an offense but he can be mm -hmm. ex, uh, uh, exempted i'll yeah. give you just one one example mistake of fact yeah we are here we all have m mobile phones mm -hmm. when we are leaving i pick your mobile phone mm -hmm. i go out uh, maybe, mm -hmm. maybe even several kilometers have yeah. i stolen that phone no it was a mistake of fact i thought it was mine okay i hope you understand that yes so now these are the six circumstances available, admissible, relevant, uh, reliable, credible, and the strength of rebuttal evidence. Mm -hmm. That is the explanation. Yes, the yes. If the file does not establish or satisfy these tests, the prosecutor raises his tools. The file is closed. Oh, and maybe just to add on to that, and maybe speak can speak to this. There are two things that can affect. Uh, the evidential test, even though you have sufficient evidence, yeah. according to the uh, offense you are considering, yeah. issues of the process, which can lead to judicial review, looking at the process, the way all these things were done, can affect the you are deciding on the evidential test, and also issues of human rights. The way somebody is uh, treated, treated from the, yeah. can, although you can have sufficient evidence, but these are some of the things that can affect 
you are determining whether or not you have uh, sufficient evidence because it would have been affected or tainted by the process that was used or by the how mm -hmm. human rights were what were yeah. Yeah. yeah so mm -hmm. if the file uh, satisfied the evidential test it, it will go to court but still we also consider the public interest test and the basis of the public interest test uh, is the constitution at Article 157 sub Article 11 no, wait wait that is not uh, what is trending is not public interest <laughs> It's not what is of what is of interest to the public. Oh, so what is it? What is public interest? Right now, uh, let me say, give an example. Uh, Wamaila has not somebody, and the public is out there. <laughs> yes. uh, the public is out there paying for our yeah. 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 We will not consider that. Is what interests the public. That is public. In, that is what is interesting to the public. Okay, so that's interesting yeah. to them. Or public interest is really it's not tangible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can't explain it because mm -hmm. it is also the interest of the accused. Mm -hmm. It is something that accrues for everybody mm -hmm. yeah. who is involved. The whole, even internationally, mm -hmm. it accrues. You cannot say this is public interest. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the best example is environmental cases. Yeah. When we talk about pollution, we talk about cutting trees. Look at the wider public interest. Can we really say this is the interest? Mm. It is something that accrues to everybody. Mm. For example, fighting corruption so that we can have sufficient money, so that we can deal with healthcare, housing, education. It is something that accrues, yeah. and it is in the interest of everybody, including their kids. I think from from a public eye, from a yeah. human's perspective, when any public interest. I'm assuming it's the noise they make on Twitter. No, no. It's uh, the noise they make on the street no. that is public interest. But clearly, in fact, the noise might actually not be public yeah. interest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very similar in the way I put it. Yeah. It is not what is interesting. Yeah, yeah. Or what <laughs> it, 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 it affects the victim, mm -hmm. the suspect, and the community. Yeah. With respect to even animals, the suspect, uh -huh. age, we consider the age, okay. Consider like a, a minor, a person of mm -hmm. under 18 years. Mm -hmm. Is it in public interest to prosecute him, more likely get a, a jail sentence, and maybe for the rest of his life? We have spoiled his life. His life, yeah. He could as well reform this person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Again, the victim, we also mm -hmm. consider uh, the, 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 the harm, yeah. what harm or impact mm -hmm. uh, to this victim. To the, to the, to, to the public, mm -hmm. we consider what is the impact. For instance, uh, corruption cases. Uh, let's say like uh, corruption cases, the most corruption cases we, uh, we work on is the uh, procurement and the uh, the misuse of CDF funds. Yes. So these monies were meant for a oh, public. Now it's COVID. Uh, COVID funds. Very well. Ah, the better you are. Victor, you 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 know that we have created laws around things that were 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 sanct sanctified. For example, within families. Mm -hmm. Like for example, now you know there can be rape within a family, mm -hmm. where a, uh, your father can rape your mother. Mm -hmm. and it can become a criminal offense mm -hmm. now we look at it in the wider picture sometimes is it in the public interest that you have to uh prosecute this father because maybe who will be the witness yeah. sometimes it could be the children now the wider public interest would uh, would um, dictate that you look at the sanctity of the family mm -hmm. and how families are treated and if you propel this kind of offenses what kind of uh, yeah. institutions would you create yeah yeah okay yeah. so we also look at the uh, whether prosecution is the best sanction yeah mm -hmm. is it the yeah. cost we are bringing witnesses uh, could we uh, divert this case mm -hmm. uh, could we just restitute give a warning mm -hmm. you understand and then lastly we also we also look at whether uh, there are interests uh, to be protected like yeah. that could be an ongoing investigation yeah if you do a prosecution you know it's a public trial you'll disclose information you would wish to mm -hmm. keep mm -hmm. confidential yeah uh, you would also wish maybe not to uh, malign international uh, relations or something like that mm -hmm. so those are the two main tests evidential mm -hmm. tests but they say uh, <laughs> the most important if it doesn't pass the evidential test yeah which is subjective and provided for under the law it doesn't you are to you uh, are told okay you wanted to ask something yeah, yeah. Um, um the three things you don't do as a suspect 
to or even as the defense lawyer, the first thing you don't do is to doubt the intention or the decision to charge your client oh. or to charge you. Mm -hmm. You must always know that they did absolutely. It has it has infinite benefits. The second the, the second thing you don't do is to withhold information which can exonerate you if this information was made available mm -hmm. to the prosecution cards. Mm -hmm. And the third thing you don't do is light a notice to forget the first two. <laughs> so what, it, what this means is yeah. every time I see a charge registered in court. Mm -hmm. The first to be on the safer side, and if you want to offer competent defense, the first thing you must you must tell yourself that you're going to jail. I tell you that first of all, let's talk about you're going to jail and let's show you how. Okay, scenario first. Yes, yes, you're going to jail. Don't just don't don't, don't be so casual and reckless in your upper say, this is just witch hunt, this is persecution, mm. this is malice. Mm. You, know, you, know, you, know, you know when you're in denial. You hurt your case more than it can ever benefit you. Yeah. I mean, these are people doing their case in public interest. And they've already generated, I want to say it, nobody went to court to compel the DPP to, to generate, <laughs> develop <laughs> guidelines and show to charge. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody went to court to compel the DPP mm -hmm. to generate guidelines on diversion mm -hmm. and people gaining rules. Mm -hmm. And to have a public conversation like this, I mean, if it, if it depends on the DPP to be proactive, and aggressive in information sharing, they have done so. How then, in that context, because when you appear in court as an accused person or a suspect or a defense attorney, you must look at the mindset of the prosecution counsel in the broader scheme of things. Yeah? Yeah. This is someone, be your view. DPP can consider that and reject it. Mm -hmm. Within his mandate, he can do so. Let me just put the trial. But it could be that he honestly missed something yeah. or there was something he did because that if provided to him, for instance, usually, and we do this all the time. I mean, this is sufficient disclosure. Yeah. The accused person's statement during the inquiry mm -hmm. is usually totally different from the statement given in the advocate's office. You can understand why. And I want you to put as you're giving me. Have you can done? actually help you not get yeah. prosecuted. Yeah. Yeah. Go and give them the person making the decision to charge you. Okay, we are short of time. Uh, so can just tell me, just, just a view of the international perspective of all this. I mean, are, are we, do we act the same globally? Because you're global citizens. Mm -hmm. Do these things apply? This, the test? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, in the U.S., we are required to go through the same sort of analysis. Do you have sufficient evidence to meet each of the elements of the charges that have been laid out? Yeah. And can you prove this case at trial beyond a reasonable doubt? Um, and, and even in the U.S., it's, it's not enough to make sure you get the conviction. Mm -hmm. You need to sustain that conviction. Mm -hmm. If it goes up yeah. on appeal, yeah. is it going to be sustained there? So you, you have to think beyond just the trial itself. Um, and so what the ODPP has done with the decision to charge is absolutely consistent with international best standards. And again, by joining what what other countries are doing, yeah. Yeah. you really do protect not just the interests of Kenya, but of all countries who want to have their citizens come here and their businesses invest here. When you and when you ensure that there's fairness, accountability, and transparency in the process, you improve the administration of justice, you secure the rule of law, you increase the confidence in the system, and that in turn shows that Kenya is moving in the right direction. Yeah. So I think that this is has been a, a <laughs> great, 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 great. great. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so uh, we have so many comments on uh, on YouTube and on Facebook. Um, is it possible to have the sessions with investigative agencies as well as the judiciary? Clearly. <laughs> Can we have the session in the judiciary? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the ODPP has got a very uh, open for, yeah. uh, policy. So we we can have them here, mm -hmm. they can be, they can answer one or two questions. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the spirit of the agency collaboration, yeah. that would be a fantastic thing. You don't operate in a vacuum, really, clearly. Yeah. We don't and, I mean, our, our aim is to make things better, yeah. not to complain about yeah. what has happened before, differences. Yeah. Our aim is how do we make everything yeah. better now going yeah. forward. Actually, right, yeah. no one is this show, I want to talk about how bad it was then. Mm -hmm. So I guess we've progressed very well yeah. about talking what, how, how good it is now. So Karen Carter says, uh, the honesty from Steve of is quite good. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, and then um, let me see. Um, the bottle water example to demonstrate the decision to charge is very simple and well put that any layman can understand. That's Brian Ayodo. Your water thing was very uh, good to pick up. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Violet. She says, good discussion. Rieka says, on a volume, clearly. <laughs> oh. uh, keep talking. Uh, somebody else. Uh, people are tuned in. Mary, Irene, um, Angie, thank you so much. I think sometimes it's very good for us to recognize yeah. our people yeah. that yeah, they know we are in this together, just not yeah. talking and downloading information to them. Please so, tell them the practitioners are coming next Friday. Yes. <laughs> So there's a question on Facebook from someone called Nikki Dread. Yeah. Why do court proceedings have to be postponed every now and then? Remember that cost mm. the system. People don't get it very well. Why can't you let or encourage some cases to be determined by the barazas? Again, alternative, all traditional methods of uh, resolving conflicts. But what is also unspoken? Is that sometimes adjournments are triggered by the defense lawyer of times, yeah? Mm -hmm. Because you know when I think I think people need to understand this, the mechanics of the, the mind of a defense lawyer. Yeah. Once you pay some deposit <laughs> and I've gone to court <laughs> and I've taken plea, the next time they can't stand enough for mention, I'm probably in another court picking up uh, already received a deposit yeah. to another client, taking plea in another court. Mm -hmm. So you must can wait. Yeah. So I think there's a bit of I think the law society needs to pick up this conversation. Mm. At least have, can we, you know, because if you're if you are running alone, it will slow down the progress. Yes. Yeah. If you bring here the investigators, you bring the judiciary, and you leave the LSA out, mm -hmm. yeah. there's need for another session. Mm. How can you build collaborative practice between the ODPP and the LSA mm -hmm. so that the clans don't suffer? Yeah. They are your clans because mm -hmm. they are in your court. They are our clans because we represent them. Yeah. So that we don't inadvertently sabotage them. We don't slow down the adjournments. Really, most of the time, I must confess, there are cases I've participated in where they have not progressed to trial. And the first thing I tell the court is that on this day I was away this much. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry for that. So we have had four adjournments, two of them attributable directly to me. Mm -hmm. And that honest admission not only surprises the prosecution mm -hmm. counsel, but helps the court look at you and your client favorably. Mm -hmm. And the court keeps on asking. As this case progresses, do you want to consider a review, a continuous review? Because I'm not, you know, mm. in short, for every statement you make that gives us the DPP yeah. of delay, there's also a, cor a corresponding yeah. obligation on the defense mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and even the court. Yeah. The court sometimes. Yeah. And let me jump on that as well, because yeah. then different efforts across the criminal justice system have been put forward to try and resolve this and this is where the chief justice delivered on case management guideline because yeah. what is is i know the country watched the george floyd trial recently and everyone was surprised that something so significant can be taken in two weeks and it is resolved yeah what is 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 how we do the case management at a court level so that it is not just taking single day uh, trials and coming once every three or for a month, yeah. because when that happens, something could have happened on a single day. Mm -hmm. Someone could be bereaved, someone could be at uh, a training, someone could have gone elsewhere. So also the and administrative yeah. process of case management for the three criminal justice agencies is critical. Yeah. And the starting point, of course, is the Council on the Administration of Justice, the National Council, where they come together and talk about it. And there have been some very good guidelines that come out of that, mm -hmm. and just a more robust approach to implementing them and managing to hold defense counsel to account would assist these cases to go to so, not. Yeah, and, and I just allow that to that, and maybe even to make out speak a bit. Yeah. How, what is the difference between our system and, say, the American system? Because we've mentioned George Floyd, and every time we hear people say, how come his came yeah. completed quickly, life went on? Why are our still dragging? <laughs> Let me first say that I think that the, ju the judiciary really is taking steps to address this. And the active case management guidelines, I think a critical component of it, which is also consistent with the U.S. system, is the importance of the pretrial conference. The pretrial conference ensures that everybody's on the same page about when evidence must be mm -hmm. turned over, um, what evidence is going to be admissible at trial, what isn't, and then more importantly, what are those critical dates that we are going to have a yes. date certain for trial? Mm -hmm. And that, to me, is what um, is, is a difference between the U.S. system and the Kenyan system. 
when you have a date certain, you know the trial is going to start that date and it's going to continue until it's completed. Mm -hmm. So there are consecutive hearing dates. Mm -hmm. um, so you can bring in an entire case within a week or two mm -hmm. weeks, yeah. depending yeah. on the amount of evidence that needs to be presented. But that also, that pretrial conference puts everybody on the same playing field, mm -hmm. that, that these are the rules that we're going to abide by mm -hmm. and that there's going to be consequences mm -hmm. if those um, not rules are, are not abided by. Yeah. Okay. Um, Carol asks, is there a mechanism? No, we didn't speak to the to, to cases being determined by balazas. Mm. Yes, there is alternative justice systems yeah. and uh, the constitution has, I think, under the section of the judiciary, included it and the judiciary has been making efforts towards that. I think it was even one so of the questions. by the judiciary. Because ideally it's the administration of justice. Okay. It is not the desire to move into cultural practices because uh -huh. those are not always governed by principles of natural justice yeah. that are key. Because you, the idea of the justice process is that you would have an orderly society. It mm. is not that you would have one group going against the other. So it's useful to have an independent objective arbiter mm -hmm. in those issues yeah. so that it would also be uh, managed and overseen by the judiciary. There are, however, then what uh, Madam Senior Counsel was talking about earlier, the alternatives to prosecution and the alternatives to trial. Mm -hmm. Those also ease the burden mm -hmm. on the court that someone can come in and acknowledge quickly and transition out. Mm -hmm. Because again, the criminal justice system is to resolve and to allow the communities to agree that we reject this conduct, not this person. Mm -hmm. So if this person can take and be held accountable for their conduct, let them come back into society. Yeah. Our interest is not to put people to the gates of the city. Again, and they would never come there if it's yeah. for it. It's not like and, and Barazas are not uh, mainstream criminal justice. So once you want to go to Barazas, the prosecutor has got nothing to do with it. Ah, yeah. We don't administer it. Although in this one, I think you must share the spotlight where it belongs and that the DPP himself at this office, we can't get in court until a charge has been registered. Mm -hmm. In terms of what well, uh, 157.6, you already said that decision is not shared. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the lowest hanging fruits that the ODP can easily harvest is to audit the penal code and all statutes creating offenses mm -hmm. and decide to decriminalize some of these offenses. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because if you decriminalize bit of there are some offenses that obviously punish poverty. Mm -hmm. There is no chance that I'll be arrested while crossing the street on a mobile phone mm -hmm. because I'll be maker. There is no chance I'll be arrested sitting on a flower pot in the CBD. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you get? Yeah. But that jobless uh, youth was walked all the way from Kayole to Nairobi. Yeah. You know, I used to live in Kayole. <laughs> <laughs> you live in Kayole and you come there to become the CBD, you should go to Nairobi. Yeah? Yeah. They tell you town bad in that. Dad, yes. And it's town of yeah. Yeah. When you're a fresh, you're a fresh graduate, you are living with a relative. Yeah. And you know, you must, the DP people must take into consideration the poverty levels in this yes, country. Yes, yes. Less than, uh, more than half live on less than $2 a day. Mm. Which means, those more than half of the are susceptible to committing offenses. Yes. Some of those offenses can be decriminalized. Mm -hmm. The petty offenses. Then the, the case will move faster. Mm -hmm. yeah. Again, as you move forward, you know, with these guidelines and with the input of all criminal stake all stakeholders, the stakeholders in the CGI system, the community, yeah. the arresting officer, because the influence of the DPP over the police office is not, I don't think it's well appreciated, it's mm -hmm. immense. Mm -hmm. Look at section 35 of the National Police Service Act. What does it say? It says the DPP has the power to direct investigations yeah. and they always do it, return this file. Yeah. Which means the inversion, mm -hmm. DPP can control mm -hmm. what comes to its desk. Over time, yeah. some of these cases, the investigating officers can say, no, the way I understand the DPP, mm -hmm. if I take this file, mm -hmm. you will divert it. And that is very, so very that is very true, Steve, because Mula, you'll realize that in in um, in um, considering decision to charge, once you have passed the evidential test and you're going to the public interest test, when considering public interest test, actually you have to look at the circumstances. It is subjective. Mm -hmm. You have to look at the circumstances of the suspects. Mm -hmm. And some of those things will come up, for example, uh, this person had no alternative, this person is poor, uh, this person could have, uh, I mean, because of other 
the person committed the offense there is sufficient evidence all right but it is not in the public interest yeah because you have you looked at the unique circumstances of the suspect yeah and decided that it is not in the public interest to, yeah yeah to that's interesting we talked about uh, uh people living in the uh, the low income uh, yeah. areas in nairobi when you talked about murder and plea plea bargain and yeah. diversion and there's a lot of uh, there's need to sensitize them because mm -hmm. people are languishing in remands because they didn't know what to do or because of poverty, they couldn't afford bail yeah. or bond. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of discussion that needs to happen in that space. Um, Carol asks, is there a mechanism for Mananchi to seek review of the decision to charge based on changed circumstances? Does Mananchi have to wait for the day the case comes to court? Or is there a way to reach ODPP to apply for review of the decision to charge? Mula. May. Uh, uh, somebody who has been charged may, mm -hmm. uh, if he so wishes, communicate with the ODPP yeah. immediately. Mm -hmm. Uh, charges are preferred mm -hmm. uh, and that can be by mail, mm -hmm. email, I mean uh, we have uh, our uh, online uh, website, you yeah. can communicate uh, through email yeah. or you can even do a letter yeah. uh, personally, individually or through an advocate mm -hmm. and it has happened we have reviewed so many files mm -hmm. uh, once we receive such uh, correspondence we call for the file, we mm -hmm. review and then of course uh, get into take into consideration the circumstances. So you don't have to wait to go to court? You don't have to wait to okay. go to court. All right. yeah. And we have done it so many times. Let me add to that. The yeah. guidelines also cover that dynamic because the idea is also to make sure the investigator and the prosecutor are on the same page on what's happening. Mm -hmm. So there's some guidelines on if the accused person is wanting to speak to you as a prosecutor, as opposed to before where you would have a quick... Uh, stay away from me, approach, I don't want to appear compromised. Yeah. There is an indication of, as long as you are both aware of what's happening, or yeah. the third party is aware, mm -hmm. so that you also protect the independence of the office and you're not accused of yeah. Yeah. having been paid off. So there is a way that uh, it can be tracked and also mm -hmm. that supervisors can be aware mm -hmm. that people are reaching out to us and telling us. Mm -hmm. And it's useful because then you also know in which gaps are not being covered mm -hmm. at the investigative stage. Okay. Uh, someone says, Duncan asks, who prefers and drafts charge sheet between the police and the prosecutors? Mule. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start with the preparing. Mm -hmm. The investigating officer, mm -hmm. that is the police, they prepare a draft. Mm -hmm. And we are not bound by the draft. It they come, recommend them. We, uh, we, we, it comes to us and then we, uh, we, we can endorse it or make changes to ensure that it complies or conforms with the legal requirements of a charge sheet because we have legal requirements of what should be contained in a charge sheet. Okay. So preparation, they prepare a draft. We are not bound by it. Mm -hmm. We can prepare. There are also circumstances where we prepare mm -hmm. the original uh, charge sheet. We sign it, file it in court. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Joseph says, with the decision to charge, is there a new charge sheet? Should be. That should be. We are gazetting, we are gazetting an ODPP, Office of the DPP charge sheet. Okay. Okay. It will be gazetted anytime, it will be out anytime. All right. Yeah. So there's someone called Backrift and he's a top fan. Thanks, Backrift. <laughs> <laughs> Apart from murder, where ODPP draws the information sheet, other cases are drafted by police. I don't know that this is a question. Only ODPP endorse the charge sheet. There is a need to employ more professional and integrated them at the station so that they assist in making decisions to charge. I think it's a recommendation. Yeah, yeah, a recommendation yeah, is yeah, making. Yeah. And then John asks... Let me comment yeah. on how that is resolved in the guidelines. Yeah. So now there is a central intake mechanism. So as opposed to files coming to individual prosecutors at any given point, there is a duty prosecutor. They know that all files will come to a central place. Mm -hmm. This one person will review them today because they're on duty mm -hmm. and then they get assigned to the people who will go to court. Mm -hmm. That streamlines that process as opposed to cases coming and bumping into you yeah. in court and yeah. you're forced to proceed. Okay. okay. Uh, John asks, when ODPP returns a file to an investigative agency to fill a certain gap and the investigative agents are not able to fill the gap, is the case closed at that point? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Of course, the file will be resubmitted to us yeah. and we will subject it to the test, mm -hmm. the evidential test yes. and the public interest test. Yes. Uh, and of course, we will require the investigator to give an explanation why those areas cannot yeah. be covered. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, Gloria says, Steve, most, mostly defense lawyers will not allow alternatives to prosecution because of the fees. Let us need to move away from that. But this is a shared responsibility between the judicial officer and the ODP. Yeah. Look at that. Office of Director of Public Prosecution. You mean this office only commandate is to prosecute? 
So if somebody if somebody wants to sabotage your work because of he wants to protect his feet, I mean you must step up mm-hmm. and stop it. Yeah. So yes, lawyers need to be sensitized. Mm-hmm. How they should not, you know, you are hired to advance and protect the rights of the agent, but yeah. not at the expense of legal fees. Mm-hmm. I mean, as, 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 as practice keeps on evolving, mm-hmm. lawyers will begin to innovate within the challenges and discover how to earn and money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 And the PPP has actually started some of that sensitization, yes. including mm-hmm. advocates out in the field to learn about diversion mm-hmm. and plea agreements. Yeah. And I think the the more that you learn about that process and how it helps your clients, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you need to be more open to it. <laughs> okay, so Paul asks, thanks Paul for your question, can ODPP open an office where the investigators can meet them for pre-trial before they prefer charges? Mm-hmm. We, we actually, under the guidelines, yeah. pre-trial is mandatory. Mm-hmm. And not only as uh, defined by the judiciary during case management, but as prosecutors, we hold pre-trial with witnesses. What we also pre-trial? We, mm. pre-trial is before you go to court for trial, but we hold pre-charge conferences. Yes. Isn't it, Mule? Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. We hold pre-charge conferences with, uh, uh, with investigating officers so that we can consult on issues. Yes. So actually, we meet investigators very often and the relationship. So you meet for the pre-charge discussion, then we meet pre-trial, pre-trial, pre-trial okay. and every time we review a case, yeah. some, it, sometimes it is desirable that you have a conference with the investigating officer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So maybe Anita, maybe yeah. you guys can clarify. Yes. There are different types of pre-trial conferences held at different stages of, mm-hmm. the, uh, of the trial process. Immediately or before the charges are preferred, you hold a, a, a pre-trial conference with the investigator to confirm that the case is ready for plea. Mm-hmm. You go for plea, you hold another pre-trial conference again with the investigator to confirm that witnesses are available, you have done disclosure. Yeah. You hold another, a third one with the court now yeah. to again ascertain that the case is trial ready. Wow. Yeah. Okay. I think that is the point now where the principal is also coming. Yes, very, yeah. uh, in terms of uh, in terms of sharing material mm-hmm. that the prosecution tends to rely on during the prosecution during the, uh, the trial, then the defense lawyer is also entitled to get that. For me, although we always request, mm-hmm. you know, that as much as and the guidelines require, so anyway, as much as possible, let all the evidence be on the record. Yeah. To the extent possible, yeah, mm-hmm. and let the accused person shortly after plea taking have access to that okay. so that they can also prepare and see how they want to engage with the process. I think the other issue as we amplify this conversation on uh, this issue to charge, mm-hmm. there's, the unspoken, there's the unspoken issue of this plea bargaining. Mm-hmm. Plea bargaining. Mm-hmm. It's part, you know, this is, it may feed into the issue to charge. Yes. Not just writing for review mm-hmm. so that the charges are terminated. Because I already said, for me, it's safer to assume and looking at these guidelines, and the rigorous training that the DPP undertakes for the officers. Yeah. Once a charge has been registered, it's separate to assume that there's a prima facie case mm-hmm. that if not responded to will lead to a conviction. Mm-hmm. If that assumption is correct, the first reaction is not a review with the view termination. How do we plead again? Yeah. Because you if you're going to be convicted, you'll be convicted whether you admit it in the lawyer's office mm-hmm. or whether you go through the full trial. Yeah. That can save time. Okay. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much. I want to go quickly through the tweets. I mean, time is just... Just going on. Uh, this is now for the ODPP. Uh, Natera Rashid asked, when are you bringing COVID billionaires to court? Yeah. <laughs> Anita, yes. this is the matter under investigation. Okay. Uh, again, let me just say we have to apply the test. Okay. And that process is ongoing. And then as you can see, there are so many other agencies investigating yes. the same. Yeah. And all, this report, all these reports are brought to the prosecutor. So that you can make a decision fed from different angles. Yeah, yeah. So it is interesting to the public, yes. but it, may not it is, at right it, at this point. It is public. It is public. public. Yes. public. So yes. it is not interesting and going public. public. Yes, yeah. it affects the interpretation of the test. Okay. Yeah. All right. I think we answered the one on the charge sheet. Um, could you have a similar confirmation regarding the Imperial Bank thieves, depositors uh, who have been tortured beyond imagination and nothing is happening considering a lot also it's a much older case so maybe that's an older case that somebody is asking about imperial bank imperial bank uh, the suspects i caught it's ongoing it has then been been slowed by 
the COVID-19 okay. uh, pandemic. COVID has slowed a lot of things, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, the processes. Yeah. But the case is in court. Yeah, we saw last week, I think, the case of uh, of Monica Kimani, the one for Joey and uh, Jackie yeah, Marie, yeah. that they asked for, for actual court sessions physical, and not physical yeah, ones. Yeah, yeah. So you can do that. Steve, Steve should also talk to advocates. Yeah. Most of them are insisting on physical hearings. Yeah. Uh, thereby thwarting our efforts to put our witnesses on the dock. Yeah. So maybe Steve <laughs> now... <laughs> is, uh, case by case, yeah, this is, yeah. I think, again, that is the response. I don't think the DP also needs to be very firm in court. Yeah. yeah. There's that. It's, this one, you can't even blame the lawyers because the lawyers have very limited law. The judicial officer, it's your court. Mm -hmm. The prosecution, it's your case. Your case. You know the evidence that is needed. You know the witness that is <laughs> <laughs> Why would the defense counsel insist mm -hmm. on physical hearing when the matter can actually progress? Mm -hmm. but, you, know, you, you have to put your feet down if someone is becoming a prisoner. Yeah. Because again, you are the state officers, public officers. If there's a delay, yeah. we will be shielded from the blame. Yeah. But you can respond. From the spot, oh. definitely. Yeah. And Frankie Paul on Twitter asked uh, Jared Otieno, the case that was uh, the fake gold case. Two years later, the case hasn't even moved to the hearing stage. Parties still attending court for mentions. So this guy uh, brings this 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 obvious public argument that with money, this country you can have your way around uh, justice. Yet you're the public lawyer. You are our lawyer. What do you say? I. <laughs> <laughs> but you're basically untouchable if you have money. Yeah, <laughs> yes. See, what people are forgetting is that a prosecutor is part of society. Yes. It is the same society that is the accused person. Mm -hmm. They are the witnesses. They are the complainants. And everybody needs to, we need to work together yes. to make sure that collect the responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And also, money plays that significant role. If you have access to more resources, then you can attend lawyers. Yeah. And all of them can insist on addressing the court. Yes. Obviously, the court gets fatigued. Mm -hmm. They look at the cost list, mentions the loan. At 21. Yeah. Wow. Then we have hearings. About seven. Then hearings continue in here. So you look at your number three on the post list. This matter, mm -hmm. for any example, this where, where, where the case person has resources. Yeah. You have 10 words on record. And each of them is, insists on taking 10 minutes mm -hmm. to address the court. That's a lot. Again, yeah. again, yeah. you can blame the lawyers because mm -hmm. the lawyers don't control the process. You blame the judicial officer. And the, you don't. I don't speak as much as you permit me to. Yes. If the prosecution client said, no, 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 we have to agree. Mm -hmm. What is it that the other lawyers want to amplify mm -hmm. that can't be said mm -hmm. by the lead cast? Mm -hmm. You can remember the DCJ case, we had 72 mm -hmm. lawyers. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. 72. 10 of them senators and members of parliament <laughs> and senior counsel. Yes, so, yes I remember that. Right. The court must be yes. in a position to control. All right, Shari M says such a noble initiative in awareness and creation among the general populace on criminal justice systems. That's a good job. Um, Jay Murphy, I think you need to work on files being presented in court instead of the many adjournments. Again, there's that we need to continue educating people about how the yeah. system works. Mm -hmm. That your officers ask for due to absence of police files. Corrupt someone, someone called corruption is evil, says. You guys are bad jokers. Update Kenyans on the progress report on all corruption cases pending in courts. And by the way, have you appealed against the release of Waluke? <laughs> yes, we have. We yeah. have. Great. <laughs> Yeah, and then we'll have a different session to discuss corruption. So yeah. we'll update, okay. we'll keep updating again also yeah. on social media how this goes. Uh, so on the criminal justice system, the pipeline, somebody says, the language Junior had said, too many processes that are in the potential. Like, <laughs> but I want to believe he's gotten it right with the, with the uh, analogy of the pipe. And then some more are saying, uh, this are one of those tweeters, those who just write. So I think we're incompetent or complicit. Okay. Yeah. yeah. He's, he's, he's entitled to his. He's yeah. entitled. But you see, we are also a reflection of him. Oh, Lord. Okay. Because yeah, <laughs> we are the society. Yeah. We are a reflection of our country. Yeah. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. and I, the an adulterated African says, what's happening with the Kemsa heist? No arrest one year later. Focus on your core mandates. But also, I think what we need to do is having a balance and especially it is very important. Yes. The law, both the Constitution or the DPP Act, there's no, there's no, there's no mandatory requirement that the PPP must win all the cases. Yes. Yeah. Actually, that could be a very wicked and evil approach. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. is to present your case to the best of your ability. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because it's based on your reading of the law. Yeah. If I'm defending a case, I'm defending it because of based on my reading. As an ethical concern, I would, personally, I feel I should be defending a case that is indefensible. That's mm -hmm. that's from lawyer to lawyer. Yeah. 
at that stage, then I would, I would, I would negotiate for plea bargaining. Yes. Yeah. But in the DPPs, the view that a, a trial of this with a reasonable chance of success is yeah. lost, yeah. I believe in otherwise. Mm-hmm. Then we get at the tra- that's why our magistrate paid for that one. Yeah. So I think the best way to audit the DPP is to look at the judges. How many of these judgments and rulings that are given that don't succeed actually indict professionalism, the professional and competence of the DPP? Mm-hmm. Because if the court is saying, I'm yeah. not convinced, even the court himself can be over that ruling and be over that ruling. So I think this blanket on the relation yeah. and the initial pressure, mm-hmm. this is really good, yeah? yeah. But the DPP is, is not doing well in terms of communication on how to manage public pressure. Mm-hmm. But the Anita, um, the Anita you must also understand that when you're con- uh, under the decision to charge, yeah. after you've considered evidential test, yeah. you have passed the evidential test, you're going into the public interest test. Mm-hmm. One of the things sometimes that can influence your mind mm-hmm. is the timing of the prosecution. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sometimes the atmosphere is so polarized that prosecuting at that time will be futile. Yeah. So, like for example, we have cases like in Nigeria, when governors were still governors, they could not be prosecuted because of the money they had and the power mm. that they wielded. Mm. Sometimes you can defer prosecution so that you do it at a conducive uh, mm. time. Mm. Mm. I'm not saying that's what you're doing, but that could but, be one of the consideration, yeah. Yeah. In mm. considerations in future. Mm. Mm. Okay. Uh, what if the investigation, Julius asks on Twitter, what if the investigation is done by a private investigator? authorized by a private security regulation authority after initial reporting policy? I think he's asking the, the role of a, a PI in all this. It's of little, little, little significance. Look at the second is rolling in the case of the yeah. so Most of the time, when you have a private investigator mm-hmm. to collect evidence, mm-hmm. there's a lot of sensor there because the, the, the very idea, the, the model of the operations that they they follow you quietly, yeah. discreetly, and then yeah. they collect information that they won't even use mm-hmm. yeah. because it's not admissible. And not yeah. even that, that is ad- advancing an individual's interest, interest. Mm-hmm. not public interest. Yeah. And it yeah. mm-hmm. You cannot use public resources to advance something that an individual thinks mm-hmm. is their interest. Mm-hmm. You see? Okay. I think maybe senior counsel should talk about policing powers of investigation because yeah. there is interpretation around yeah. that. Yeah. The investigative function has been vested yes. in the police. Yes. In the they are supposed to do that and handle over the investigation to the mm-hmm. prosecution. Mm-hmm. This is the Republic. Mm-hmm. And the Republic is containing uh, the public yeah. uh, in terms of order. Yes. And so those are the vested institutions with investigative mm-hmm. powers. Mm-hmm. Anyone else is then mandated through the manner prescribed by the Constitution mm-hmm. and the law. Mm-hmm. So for instance, KWS investigates, but they have gotten authority, and so they have yeah. investigative powers. Yeah. IPOA have investigative powers. So Investigation is not a private function, mm-hmm. it is part of public good, mm-hmm. it is um, regulated by the Republic. Mm, okay, I think there's just another, another question on private... Uh, but that information can be used by the police yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. To, to inform their mm-hmm. investigation. Do Kenyan criminal law allow for private criminal prosecution? Is that something like that? Yeah. What is it? Private, private criminal prosecution. Yeah. I, I, one is not, I'm not satisfied with the decision not to prosecute. Can a private citizen pursue it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think if I am not satisfied, that's what yeah. he meant. Yeah. yeah. I think, uh, I know, <laughs> yes, the law allows it, but yeah. rarely will you get there. Yeah. Uh, I see some people threatening that we will you have to apply to the court. Okay. You know, that either the DPP can give permission, which rarely happens, mm-hmm. or you need to move to court. Yeah. The court can permit you, which also, I think, that, that opportunity is there in the extreme and rarest of circumstances. Mm-hmm. The DPP refuses blatter Mandate so the answer party. is actually yes, yeah. but you must satisfy the conditions that have ah, been set down by the law. Okay, isn't it? Yes, yes, yes. All right, we are winding up. Um, I've seen many, someone says, Lucian Organo asked, I've seen many adjournments in criminal courts due to the I.O. Now I know, investigative. <laughs> <laughs> Not complimenting the prosecution well enough. Is the OBTP in control of that? Uh, what we are doing now, yes. we are using court users committees. Yeah. Uh, court users committees comprise of all the players mm-hmm. in the criminal justice system. Yeah. We bring along the prosecutor, we bring along the LSK, mm-hmm. we bring along the investigators, yeah. we bring along the judicial uh, officers yes. uh, so that there is harmony, there is synergy and there is working together. Mm-hmm. And it has worked in very many stations mm-hmm. uh, because you said if it is the investigator, uh, why are they not bringing files? or witnesses mm-hmm. to court, mm-hmm. uh, they are able to say these are our challenges. Mm-hmm. 
and then they can be discussed together and as a solution uh, reached. Uh, so we are working on it, uh -huh. and there are some stations. I was in a station this week uh -huh. uh, where there was that problem, and the judge himself said, I have solved this problem of non-availability of police files through court users committee. Oh, okay. But also to complement that, Tomeka talked about the central case intake where now you don't take the files to court, you bring them to a central place mm -hmm. in the, either at the county level, regional level, or in the headquarters, so that they are, they are, our intake is central. Okay. What we are doing, when fully operationalized, yeah. we'll be having a duplicate of the police file that we are referring to. Mm -hmm. So we'll no longer be referring to the investigating officer unless when we need the originals. Mm -hmm. So we'll be having the files with us so that the issue of the files not being brought mm -hmm. will not arrive. Like we are also encouraging... Uh, forensic and scientific evidence so that we move away from much of oral evidence mm -hmm. is more credible and it is easier to preserve and to present before court. Okay. Um, somebody on Facebook, Jeff Kamakil and Athanas Jalego, the ODPP has a public and complaints. Uh, you can lodge a complaint. I've seen they put a complaint about land. I was just discussing in the morning about how land is civil until a criminal act is committed. Mm -hmm. So we we're just saying here that maybe for this this comment on land and, and this case that they don't have resolution to, they can write to the public complaints yes. at odpp dot Yes, yeah, yeah, that's why. Yeah. Yes, sorry about that. Yes, um, there's, there's, been, there's been a lot of questions on Twitter, but again, it's all people not understanding the process, and I think it's a continuous conversation. People not understanding the role and the mandate of the ODPP, mm -hmm. and of course, how the criminal justice system works, and of course, the, the rights of the accused. What do you have any rights, even once you have everything uh, against you? Do what can what can be done? So there's a lot of conversation going on, and we, are, we intend to do this on this platform. But tell them they have all the rights under the constitution, including the ones that are in international instruments yeah. Yeah. and have been incorporated into our constitution. Yes, okay. I am going to give you, this is a finally, not an African finally, this is actually finally, mm -hmm. finally remarks. Are we making progress? We are making progress. I can confirm that uh, we are getting uh, more convictions because of the use of the guidelines. They are about one year old, but we are getting more conviction. So it has improved your conviction rate? Yeah, and, that, and why? Because the prosecutor is convicted, and the, con the prosecutor has got all the materials to prove their case beyond reasonable doubt. Because the, uh, the file, the investigation file, passed through a sifting process uh, that is making the decision to charge. There is no guesswork. There are parameters that are set. set. The, first, uh, the prosecutor knows them. Secondly, there is public confidence. Mm. Yeah, the, con the public knows, including even uh, the, some the players in the justice system, the investigating agents. They know when I'm going to a prosecutor, this is what I expect. When I send my file, this is what I expect. So they prepare in advance. Okay, so let me ask you just, I, I think I'm not running out of questions, yeah. but there are 29 court stations in Kenya. Well, yes. There are prosecutors in all the stations. Yes. Then there are 47 counties. Yes. Do they, do they, do they have the authority to, to make the decision to charge on all cases or do some of them come here to Nairobi? No, no, no. They have the, uh, the authority to make decision in all cases apart from mm -hmm. There's a threshold. Uh, uh, corruption. It's only the DPP who gives consent to prosecute but corruption. There, there is a guideline, yeah. there is a guideline yeah. on the threshold mm -hmm. yes. because it will depend, for example, on the amount of money, it will yeah. depend on the mm -hmm. status of the person, it okay. will depend on many yeah. things. So it so won't be a chicken seller in no, no, your country. No, no, no. There is a threshold that we have a guideline on that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, and, and also in counterterrorism yeah. cases, there's a cases of, yeah. of, of mm -hmm. national interest. Okay, you don't know we have specialized right. units here, so yes. there are cases that must come to the specialized units. Okay, mm -hmm. Tomika, are we making progress from your perspective? Are we finally part of the global, uh, what is it called, uh, movement in access to in, in access to justice, improving access to justice? Are we good? Let me say, I think Kenya has always been a part of the global movement, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and it's, it's about how to make the criminal justice process more efficient. Mm -hmm. And I think that the decision to charge bad minds are absolutely going to help in that process. And, and in particular, the development of the, the, the processes that are going to be equivalent in whatever county you are in. Mm -hmm you know that the case is going to be reviewed in the same way, it's going to be prosecuted in the same way. And I think that that's obviously going to make things improve matters here in Kenya um, and ensure that the rights of 
citizens are, are upheld. So I definitely think that everything is moving in the right direction. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly um, improving the administration of justice has that interest that's not just national, it's international. So absolutely. Okay, Steve. I'm going to speak to the challenges because uh, it's successful. I wanted to ask you actually, <laughs> room for improvement, what do you think? <laughs> well, then, let me just step up. I know this is my last comment to appreciate, you know, honesty. You know, when you watch this, actually follow this series for me, you just see, you know, the panelists. You yeah. Know, you don't, I mean, the infrastructure, the personnel, the work that they to project this just so that the public can be updated, yeah. I think is immense. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I mean, what I've seen here is a man that I really, really appreciate. That really, really is a great work going yeah. on there. Thanks. Some of the challenges that remain unsolved mm -hmm. or opportunities for improvement, how many doubts whether the DPP understands the overarching influence of his mandate on the entire criminal justice system? Because you look at the broad spectrum, the CJS, from the community to the investigator, the police, to his office, to the court, to prisons to probation and aftercare, yeah. back to the community. There's going to be a lot of stress if the DPP buys more than he can chew. Mm -hmm. So he must learn to disperse some of these functions mm -hmm. because also if he doesn't disperse them or take an interest, I'm not, you know, his, his mandate is well defined, yes, but I'm saying, what I'm saying is this. I don't think there should be joy in the coping convictions, convictions all the time. It goes the other way. It could also mean that Kenya generally is a country that is full of people just law breakers, you get? Yeah. Mm. Because you are convicting them on the merit. Mm -hmm. So when there's that joy, and you're achieving your mandate to put bad guys behind bars, but you don't have to ingest our prison. You're looking at, can you body your work? And tell us what can you do to make sure that the society is gender compliant. There are countries like Sweden, the Scandinavian countries, they're actually decongesting, the, they're closing prisons. Mm -hmm. Because no one is being prosecuted, no one is being convicted. I mean, but That's here, paradise, no? <laughs> yeah, so, it's not. Yeah. so I think there's the mandate, the core mandate, mm -hmm. but then there's the extension of that mandate mm -hmm. that the DPU must must lead the others, yeah? Yeah. so that we can have a, a society that has low rate of crime, low crime rates, low recidivism rate, which means repeat offenders, mm -hmm. yeah. and the people that actually get there when they're convicted, they're, all of us will be satisfied that he has done his mandate. So it is much safer. Yeah, and of course, they criminalize some. They criminalize some of those offenses. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the civil society much better, like lawyers much better. Be found in court, let the magistrates tell them the challenges they face. Yeah. Because the people that by law, the people that are held accountable are public officers. Mm -hmm. The law tends to push on private actors or private practitioners, yes. even if you are part of the problem. Yes. So you must take charge. Yeah. Thank you. Omaida. Uh, final words. Yes, I'm with the <laughs> Are we there yet? Uh, I think we're getting there. Mm -hmm. Society has mm -hmm. changed, crime has changed, people have evolved, and with that kind of evolution, even the criminal justice system must respond to it. Yeah. Before, the greatest threat was money would be stolen by, from my past. Mm -hmm. Then there was the people who send me a message and say, Rudisha and Pesa. Then there is, it has been withdrawn yes. from my account. All those are showing the sophistication in crime. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The change in how people view mm -hmm. what they're entitled to or what, how far they will go to get mm -hmm. what they want in terms of legal deeds. Yeah. So much so then that the criminal justice system must respond to that. Mm -hmm. So in terms of responding to that, this is very necessary. In terms of coming and telling the public the nature in which you have responded, this is an effort in making sure that you don't criminalize poverty. Steve talked about it before because the ones who are most vulnerable as the quickest way to respond to crime mm -hmm. is those who are living mm -hmm. at levels of poverty where they do not understand the system, yeah. they do not understand why they are under attack, and people in power can actually reach out and make sure these people pay for things they didn't themselves do. So where we have, uh, I think, to go now is move closer to that stage yeah. where people feel that they live within the protection of the law. Yes. That because I do not have economic means, I am not vulnerable to being a victim of the criminal justice right. system. Um, and Steve gave an interesting analogy of sitting on a port in town. But that should not be, you know, the greatest risk in my life. Yeah. That I can come on an ordinary day. I, need to feel safe. I can lose my liberty. I am not sure why. 
and I only hear charges when we have gotten to court. Mm. So this is an extension to the public and pain. We want to make sure that everyone lives within the protection of the law. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So in that regard, it is a good step forward. Mm. There is still a lot more to be done yeah. to protect the it's more vulnerable because now it has reduced, it has addressed the more complex. Yeah, yeah. So you have a mic, madam. You don't need both. <laughs> So I was reading, I think, an article someone wrote and said, actually, trust in government has gone down, especially government services and ODPs at government office. And someone was arguing, we need to renegotiate the social co- the social contract we have with the government. Yes. I think we gave them too much. Yes. But now we are saying you're the public defender. Yes. Why should we trust you? How do we continue this relationship with this, and especially with such uh, guidelines? Um, you know, what people should realize is that the purpose of the criminal justice system is to make sure that we have a safe society, our properties are safe, and we are safe. Yeah. Secondly, what people should realize is that prosecution is like post-mortem. Mm-hmm. Everything has happened. We come at the tail end of the activity, and we are supposed to punish the person who committed the offense. Mm-hmm. As much as we are trying to put the, ba- uh, the bad people behind bars, there is a need for all of us as a society to make sure that we prevent offenses from occurring. Yes. And therefore, the kind of punishment that are meted by judiciary must, um, must um, respond to the need to prevent crimes. Mm-hmm. And for that reason, you realize that the Office of the Director of Public Prosecution is now putting a lot of effort in asset forfeiture and confiscation because when you know that if I commit an economic crime, I will lose most of my property, then it censures me not to commit an offence. So we are going beyond the original intention of punishing people that yeah. they just have to go and stay in prison. Mm. We are taking over their assets. And I think that has increased the, the faith that people have in the, crimin- in the Office of the Director okay. of Public okay. Prosecutions. Okay. Secondly, we are taking in a lot of pupils. For example, now we have taken 100 pupils and interns. They learn what we are doing and we hope that when they go back to society, they'll blend into the objective of the office of the DPP to make yeah. the society better. Yeah. They'll, they'll always, they'll, they'll, we will always have complaints against us, against the government, like all over the world. But people must realize that so long as there's technological advancement, globalization, international crimes, yes. th- the uh, public entities will always lag behind the criminals. Mm. For example, now everybody's talking about virtual asset service providers, <laughs> cryptocurrency yeah. and Bitcoin, and you realize that a prosecutor might be called upon all of a sudden that a Kenyan has committed that kind of offense in another country and you're supposed to react. So instead of taking this person to court, you're still looking at, do I have sufficient laws? Do I have uh, police prosecutors who yeah. are um, capacitated? And for that reason, I think we are on the right track and with the Prosecution Training Institute will not only train the prosecutors and the law enforcement agencies, but even the public so that we work together because at the end of the day, it is a shared responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. I don't know whether it is prudent for me to end this without saying we have a nominee for the Chief Justice who is a woman. The present uh, is the uh, female. <laughs> It's no longer the future, it's the present. I even saw Joe Biden saying uh, he's addressing Madam Vice President and Madam, I think, Speaker. And uh, yeah, it was, I think, also a fast for them. So yes. the present is female. Yes. So let's run. We break the ceilings and move very, on the speaker close. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's been quite uh, a chat and a good one. I hope you got something from it. At least I did. But you can always go back to the video and just listen to what some views that have been made by the strong panel of experts. You see what it means for the decision of uh, the decision to charge, what it means to you as a citizen, and what happens when you have, you know, it doesn't have to happen to you. It can actually happen to somebody else, you know, and you'll be in a position to advise them. Like you say, when you know, then you're empowered. So thank you once again. Thank you for engaging with us on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. We will try and respond to the questions you have. We've tried to address some. I can't mention everyone. I can't pull up at an issue on this show. So I can't mention all of you, but I'm grateful for you joining us. We look forward to seeing you again next week. I wish you a good weekend and a blessed week ahead. See you again uh, next week, Friday.